Hello, everyone, and happy Saturday. Welcome back to Curse of Strahd Twice Bitten, the show where five DMs take on D&D's top gothic horror campaign. As always, I am Dragna Carta, your host and DM, and thank you all for tuning in this wonderful weekend. Um, hopefully it should be a good one this week. Uh, we've been uh, eagerly awaiting our return after uh, last week's uh, therapy session. So we'll see uh, if the trauma is at all settled. It might not be. Ah. Uh, Spoiler alert, uh, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we've got some announcements as always, but we will hit on those after our break. So I think we are all ready to jump off. So let's get started with Curse of Strahd, Twice Bitten. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Last we left off on Curse of Strahd, Twice Bitten. After rescuing the Wizard of Wine's winery and missing the Festival of the Blazing Sun, our travelers returned to Velaki, only to find that Irina Koliana had been kidnapped by Izek Strozny, the sadistic enforcer of Baron Vargas Velakovich. Their plans for rescue were soon interrupted, however, when a group of vampire spawn attacked St. Andrew's Church in the night, staging a gruesome and bloody slaughter that saw Father Lucian Petrovich dead, led by Strahd von Zarevich himself. Efforts to warn Baron Velokovich of the attack proved fruitless, however, but through savvy tactics, an unexpected ally, and some sheer simple luck, including a very fortunate uh, death-saving throw, the party managed to slay Izek and recover Irina from the Baron's mansion, Fle fleeing through the night to the Blue Water Inn. There, the companion sought shelter with Erwin and Danica, who swiftly ushered them to a secret attic hidden above the inn. Ismark rejoined the group, and the companion soon turned to bed, struggling to process the horrific events they'd encountered. That night, Metrion was met by a new dream sent by the Wounded One, who praised his attempts to glean additional information about Lillison's apparent resurrection, and commanded him to delve deeper into the source of her new, strange, almost unearthly appearance and features. The next morning, the PCs discussed potential future plans, with Ismark pledging to escort Arena to the Abbey of St. Markovia in Kresk, and after hiding away from a raid by the Baron's guards, the travelers concealed themselves within Adrian Mardikov's wagon beneath a layer of hay from the stables and bid farewell to Velaki. The group departed the town and headed to the nearby Vistani encampment to secure information about escape from Barovia. En route, Irina shared her concerns and confusions following her captivity at Izek's hands, to which Ismark revealed that she was not Kolian's true daughter, but had in fact been found wandering the woods at the base of the Pillarstone of Ravenloft as a child, where she was adopted into the Burgomaster's family. Struggling to process information, she split off from the group, stepping behind in their wake as she worked to process her new mission of self-discovery. Arriving at the encampment, the group discovered a circle of cottages at the base of the Vistani's Hill, which, much to Erthrandir's delight, appeared to belong to a community of elves. The group agreed to split up, with Kiva and Metreon joining Adrian and Elvir Mardikov on their trip to purchase horses from the Vistani, 
Will Erthrandir, Amity, Lillison, Ismark, and Irina venture together to the home of an elf, elf named Casimir at the south side of the hill? And so... Together, the five of you, joined by Ismark and Irina, as you hear the rattling and creaking of the Marta Cub's wagon slowly fade as it makes its way up the well-worn tracks of the hill, you make your, your way around the left side of the hill, passing beyond several additional small cottages with gray cloaked figures standing in front of them. You can see low plumes of smoke emitted from chimneys atop these small hovels, and as you make your way around the south side, each of their gazes uh, linger upon you in turn. These guards or sentries taking careful notice of the newcomers to their settlement. As you approach the house at the southern base of the hill, you can see, standing quietly in front of this house, bathed in the warm light of its lanterns, are three sullen gray cloaked figures, their angular features and black flowing hair half hidden under their cowls. Their eyes watch you suspiciously as you make your way forward. What do you do? Earthrendir is going to take a look at the others and then step forward, given the sentry's little bow. Morning, y'all. I was told by your friend Saraz that there was a folk named Casimir who lived here. He said that I'm a traveler from outside parts, and he said that he'd be happy to talk to me about, well, just, he kind of gives like an ecstatic gesture around, well, everything. I've never met an elf community out here somewhere this far before, and I'd be thrilled to get a chance to talk to him if he's amenable. The three guards glance amongst each other. You notice that all of them, all three of them are uh, male elves, uh, pointed ears visible, uh, up with the cows of their cloaks pulled down uh, of dark skin and hair, similar to uh, Saraz. Uh, one of them meets your gaze, Erthrandir. Well, if you are looking for um, assistance, uh, and well, if you're interested in meeting Casimir, I don't suppose it would be a problem, but just uh, if I might uh, have your name again. Oh, Erthrandir Ariel. I can spell it if you need it. Not a need for that. Um, if you'll excuse me, I'll uh, here, let me just uh, duck inside for a moment. Uh, he glances at the other two, uh, enters the door, uh, and closes it behind him. For that moment, you have view of a small, cozy vestibule before the door shuts again behind him. There's a pause for a few moments, and then the door clicks open, and the uh, male elf steps outside once more. Kazumi is uh, glad to speak with you. Oh, he thank you nods so inside. much. He gives he like kind of grabs his hand to shake and then steps forward giving a look back to Lilson and Amity come on they're right in here and he just kind of slips inside yeah Amity happily follows uh, Erthrandir assuming she's allowed in Lilson is going to pause for a moment um, on the threshold take a look at these three elves um, what what kinds of emotions do they uh, seem to be expressing Give me an insight check for me. I would love to. That is a 12. 12. They seem to have largely stony faces, uh, fairly reserved. Uh, there is a bit of caution there, but lessened a bit. They do seem to have been slightly disarmed by uh exuberance, um, but there's no indication of special amounts of joy, just kind of a kind of stoic um, sense of caution is all you glean. Okay. Lillison will, um, after pausing that bit, just smile and nod to all three of them and then follow Erthrandir and Amity inside. All right. Ismark and Irina give the elves respectful nods before passing inside. Uh, Ismark shutting the door behind him. You enter into a small, cozy vestibule several degrees warmer than the chill mists outside. 
The walls of this small chamber are decorated with hanging sketches and portraits of proud and wise-looking elves with dark skin, as well as additional pictures of treeborn spires carved of dark wood, as in, alongside artistic depictions of constellations and celestial bodies. Two curtains of rough, dark brown fabric obscure the entrance to another, another chamber beyond. You hear a voice, a bit muffled beyond the curtains. If you don't mind, uh, feel free to come in. Erythrin Deer, like, nods, forgetting that they can't see him, and just kind of steps into the room, goggling, especially at the portraits. He just kind of, like, steps up to them, eyes wide. Good god. I, I didn't know stuff like... Goodness gracious, you have a lovely correction, sir. There's a pause um, for a few moments, and then you hear the sound of footsteps approaching. Um, there's a slight rustle as the uh, right side curtain is pulled aside, uh, and there you see another elf of similar dark skin to the others. He wears a dark brown cloak inset with green spirals and curves that almost resemble growing vines, and a cowl over his head that conceals much of his hair and other features. You can see that he has dark eyes and skin and long ebony hair beginning to turn silver that runs down past his shoulders over his chest. It is a bit of a collection, though I can't uh, claim uh, authorship of all of them. Hey, you Welcome. don't have to be an author to be appreciative. To be appreciative. I yes. presume you're uh, Ethrand, was it? My name is Casimir. And, Not on uh, the first try. Not many people do that. Pleasure to meet you all. Those pictures are... Casimir bows in return. Those pictures are a bit of a personal collection. Um, but I'm glad you enjoy them. Hmm. Yeah, no, I gotta ask. The settlements, are they... Is that fr is that taken from life, or is that a fan... Is that a fiction? The sketches, um... An old kingdom. Uh, I don't suppose you've heard of uh, a throne to deal. Have I heard of a throne to deal? Make a history check. Yeah. Ten. Ten. You have not. Erythrindir is not. I haven't. What? Uh, would, would you mind? What was it? It, um... Well... If we were to have a proper conversation, perhaps standing in my uh, foyer isn't the best place. Please, come in. Uh, I'll see if I can find you some proper seats, though I apologize. They're not the most comfortable accommodations. Hey, any accommodations you give to a guest are comfortable enough. Thank you. He smiles, uh, though it's... Uh, it'll listen, given your... Uh, what's your passive insight? Uh, passive insight would be 14, I think. 14. It's, he gives a smile, but you can tell it's more of, you know, a, a host's smile. He's, he seems to just be, you know, doing his best to be friendly. Um, he leads you into uh, a larger chamber beyond the curtains, lit and heated by a fireplace at the north end. You can see an old red armchair sits facing the fire, just beside an old wooden table flanked by several chairs. The left side wall of this comfortable room bears a dozen cubby holes bearing small wooden statuettes of elven figures. The opposite wall bears a tapestry of a lush and beautiful forest beneath the noonday sun. Casimir glances around your group um, and uh, moves to pull the uh, armchair to the side. Um, if any of you would like to take a more comfortable seat, I'm afraid this is the one piece I have. Um, I don't mind standing. Please, uh, if you would like. Uh, you notice that he doesn't uh, remove the cowl, but just sort of uh, stands uh, in front of the wall. Uh, which bears the tapestry facing toward you. Hmm. Earth and Deer will gesture for Amity or Lillison to take it. Lillison's going to shake her head and uh, put on her very best smile and say, Oh, not at all, please. We would not wish you to uh, be inconvenienced in your very own home, after all. A Amity also shakes her head and smiles. Uh, I actually prefer standing too. Erythrin Deer stares at the three of you, sighs, and sits down in the armchair. 
Casimir uh, chuckles quietly and takes a seat at the uh, head of the table. Um, you notice the furthest away from the fireplace, uh, ushering for the others to take a seat. Uh, Ismark and Irina uh, nod gratefully and take seats as well. Uh, presumably, uh, well, there's one more empty seat if anyone would like to take it. Wilson's going to go over to the tapestry and uh, start looking at that and uh, pretend not to be paying as close attention to the conversation as she maybe actually is. Casimir uh, steeples his fingers, leaning uh, forward on the table. So, welcome to uh, my humble home. Again, I apologize for the lack of creature comforts. We're out of tea at the moment. Uh, the Vistani uh, don't bring it often enough, and it can be a bit... Uh, a bit of a steep hack, but uh, if you return, uh, perhaps in a few weeks, we might have something. But Earthman in the meantime, up a finger and digs into his pack, in which he produces a kettle and his bag of tea. Well, I got it from a place where it's not imported very far. If that'll help, he blinks at it. Now that is a treat. Uh, please, if you wouldn't mind, I'd be glad to uh, settle that for you. It's, uh, might I ask what kind you brought? Uh. Uh, it's Ostra Gray. It's a rare old breed, not grown much these days, because you gotta have it. Plants don't grow outside of a greenhouse, but it's good mellow blend. He frowns, nodding. Ostra. That, 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 uh, that's that old, uh, Sun Elf, uh, settlement down, a. Uh, Southwest side of the Sword Coast, ain't it? Southeast, but yeah, no, you, yeah, yeah, that uh, by the Sea of Fallen Stars, that, yeah, no, it's a, it was a, yeah, yeah. Of course, forgive me, it's uh, been a while since I recalled uh, <laughs> geography. Oh, for heaven's sake, you're going off of memory, I'm not about to start lecturing you, but yeah, no, it's a, he kind of just blushes a little, enjoy your tea. Thank you. I'll uh, put some on. If the rest of you would like it, I, sh I should be able to rustle up some cups. Uh, I don't have company often, but what I can manage, I'll be more than glad to provide. Um, but Ofstra, it's a good place, good people, though I've never had the fortune of uh, making it there myself. Met a few of their merchants. Good folk. <laughs> you? Well, you've met another again. I'm a native. Oh, well. Well met. It is a pleasure. Um, might I ask how... Um, well, we don't often see uh, elven folk in these here parts. Uh, Barovia is a bit of an out-of-the-way path, I dare say. Yeah, we're not exactly here by choice. Uh, I would suspect it much. It's a bit of a long story, and why don't we get that tea brewing first? Of course. Casimir kind of settles up, uh, kind of perching the kettle above the uh, burning fire in the fireplace. Uh, he watches it begins to heat the kettle. He nods in quiet satisfaction and begins assembling cups from the uh, small cubby hole next to the uh, elven statuettes. Um, actually, Erthrindir, you would recognize these statuettes as uh, small depictions of elven deities. Uh, you recognize a. Uh, Coralon, you recognize Sahini Moonbow, you recognize several other notable deities of the Elven Pantheon. <laughs> As he busies himself, uh, Casimir uh, says, is back to you. So, um, I must say I am a bit intrigued uh, how you managed to find your way to my uh, my abode. Uh, oh, were yeah. Were you simply seeking hospitality, or? Uh, no, no, I mean, I mean, grateful to have it, of course, and he looks at the others, but I... Uh... Honestly, I'm. To to be frank, I it's from where I've been living the past sixty years or so. I've had very little contact with other elves, so it's honestly was just. And I'm also a historian by trade, so kind of seeing a colony out here was well, like a breath of fresh air on a muggy day. So I just I suppose it's a. <laughs> And I apologize for, well, intruding upon your time, but I was just looking for a conversation. He frowns, uh, setting the cups down and retaking his seat at the table. Uh, historian. Well, that's an interesting profession. 
Uh, unfortunately, I fear you've not found, uh, well, there's plenty of history here, but not like as much to matter, I'm afraid. What do you mean by that? Well, the way I see it, um, us dust kettles, we've had a good run, but Barovia is where uh, stories seem to come to end, so I wouldn't worry over much about it. Oh, that, well, <laughs> I appreciate I I can see that, and of course, I'm not going to tell you where your story begins or ends, but I'd still like to hear it, even if it is coming to a close. He uh, nods and leans back in his chair. He glances over at Lillis and you seem to be uh, enjoying a tapestry. I don't suppose you've ever heard of the Otelu Wood. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, very sorry. I was just admiring the fine needlework here. Um, no, I'm not I'm not familiar with the subject matter. Oh, not a problem. Not a problem. Unlike the uh, others in the front, that one was uh, a purchased piece, but uh, certainly no less valuable for it. In its time, it was a beautiful place. Uh, the Throne de Thiel was its crown jewel. And, uh, well, if your friend uh, really is that interested, I suppose it wouldn't hurt. Most of the others are out and about at the moment, and I can't say that I've over much duties to attend to. Only if it, only if you wish. I'm fine to... I know this sort of thing can take a lot of, well, mental effort, so, you know, I'm happy to sit here and have small talk for an hour or two if you'd prefer, but I would like to hear. It's not a problem. Um, believe me... I and my brothers have had ample time to um, reflect. It's uh, no trouble at all. Well, um, the Throne of Thiel uh, was a beautiful place. In the uh, the Otelu Wood was uh, at its at its peak, a shining example. We paid our homage to uh, Sayanine Moonbo when she paid her patronage to us in return. It was um, a shelter from the Protectors of Vengeance, but it was a home. It was a place of life and latticework of tree and vine and branch and the way those architects used to sing the trees into shape it was a sight to behold and uh, a poem to the ears what we do today isn't a, a match for what they used to be able to do but we make do with what we have earthman deer's a little misty i'd 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 only heard stories of the old cities like that we uh <laughs> We were by a coast, so the trees there weren't really fit for singing into those sort of shapes, but it sounds beautiful. It was. It was a... Uh, <sighs> it was a dream to remember for as long as it lasted. Of course, not all were entirely happy with it. The leadership could be um, prideful at times, perhaps, but... It was a place of peace for the time that it lasted. I reckon I was around, oh, wasn't that old, maybe 100, 150, when um, things started to get a little rocky. Amity rolls her eyes at the, um, uh, you know, 150 being young. Arthur Deer shoots a dagger glance at her and then leans forward. Uh, what happened? Well, I suppose that by proxy might be a bit familiar. Um, 
Well, you might not understand the full reach to the end of uh, this particular history. I am aware of how our pride leads often leads us to a downfall. It's a defining trait. Indeed. You see, um... Well... Technically, as a manner of speaking, Othran Dathil was an independent nation-state. Uh, more of a city-state, if you would. I suppose is the way historians might rank these things. But they were... Um, Depending on what kind of uh, maps you inspected, they, uh, the border territory might have fallen under the purvey of a uh, neighboring uh, sovereignty. The maps are always very conveniently drawn when that sort of thing needs to happen, aren't they? They are, as a matter of fact. And in this particular case, there was... Well... There was a particular man, a king he called himself, though his claim to his throne, I personally found dubious, though I reckon as historians would say there was no doubt that he had royal blood. He was a man named King Barov, demanded a fealty from our people. Of course, if going by the maps that we had in our treasuries, there was no consideration. Uh, his envoys were sent away without as much as a bio leave. He did not take that refusal kindly. I'd imagine he did. Came back with an army. Quite so. It was uh, all the more angered and humiliating. You see, his armies, one of the generals, were led by one of our own, an exile named Rahadin. He knew too much of our defenses, of our geographies, hell, of our politics. Didn't take long for Barab's armies to conquer the territory that still held out. The princes that had once defied him, their heads uh, wound up on stakes before long. Meanwhile, the rest of us, Casimir winces. Life ain't easy when you're hiding like a rabbit from a fox. Erythrindir just kind of shakes his head. No, no, I... I'm sorry, that... That's... I'm... Well, I mean... You know, whatever the circumstances, that... Losing that to one of your own, no less, that's... Tragedy, I'm... I'm deeply sorry, Casimir. I appreciate the sentiment, but believe me, my folk have had ample time to reflect on uh, the choices our people made. <laughs> well, perhaps, but that doesn't, just because it was a long time ago, doesn't mean that it stops being there. Fair. As a manner of speaking, I don't disagree. There were some, um, perhaps myself included, who thought that there was some means of resistance yet available to us. Some of our kind were subjugated, forced into servitude, or worse, at Barov's uh, direction. Others of us went among, uh, well, their wagons are right there at the top of the hill. You folded in with the Visitani. Some of us did. I myself was not among us. I did what I could. I, at the time, I was still young and fiery and saw it as my duty to try to keep the flame going. We had a... Well... We had a good run. At least till Barov died and his son took over. You see, uh, if you don't mind my asking, how long have you been in uh, Barovia thus far? He looks at the others. Is it... Good grief, has it just been a week? Something like that, yes. 
Hmm. Well, that's still uh, longer than some outsiders manage to survive. Given that time, I suppose you've heard our friend up in the castle. Jeez. Oh, yes, that we have. Hmm. Too much. Well, then, I suppose you won't be surprised by his existence, but... I don't suppose... Well, it might surprise you to know that King Barov's family name was Von Zarevich. Oh, no. Erythrindir's just kind of looking at the ground, his pan shaking. So, Barov's son, and he just kind of makes a vague gesture towards the direction of Ravenloft. He's... him? Casimir nods grimly. Asks about the right of it. Strahd von Zarevich. It was his father's eldest son. Started his wars uh, a little less than four centuries ago. Sought to do what his father couldn't, and his ways were cruel and harsh. His father might have put heads on spikes, but Von Zarevich left living folk uh, on the spikes, left there to expire under the sun. Our own little uh, makeshift rebellion was all but dead in a few months. Every, every last dusk elf would have been laid out in the graveyard if we hadn't laid down our weapons and surrendered to the new leader's whims. I'm, I'm so sorry, Emily says. Um, was, was there still a, a wall of mist back then? Wall of, oh, you're talking about, hmm. You know, there's a lot of names for that. I've heard that some call it um, the wall of mist, others, well. Casimir looks thoughtful for a moment. You know, I've heard that uh, the mountain folk of Barovia said that there was always a wall of mist on one part of Barovia, but as for the rest of around it, I can't say. In those days, it was called the Whispering Wall, but nowadays it's more of a marker of territory. And I certainly haven't tried to hear any whisperings on its edge. Not that I would care to try. I'm, I'm sorry, but if you know about the Sea of Stars and about Ostra, can you tell us where this place used to be? Where, where we are on, on the world map? Yeah, I was, I was just thinking, we, where we are, we, when we got here, the geography was radically different. We were on our be. way between, um, I'm sorry, be between Coneyberry and, and Neverwinter. There wasn't supposed to be any sort of place like this in between. He frowns. Coneyberry. Now that's not a name I'm familiar with. Uh, forgive me. Um, I haven't been to the area of the Sword Coast personally. Um, well, Throne the Field was a bit of the ways to the east of the Sea of Fallen Stars. Um... I think I've heard of the name Neverwinter, but I apologize, I've never been there. Wait, you were east of Ostra? But that would mean we have were hundreds of miles away. Barovia geography is, um, it's not all too picky. It takes folks from a whole lot of places. Some of them not even from uh, the world we know, if you'll believe it. I, I mean, I, you've given me no reason to distrust you, but you understand if that one's a little hard to swallow. I've met folks who have told me stories of strange lands, none that I've ever heard of. But then again, I suppose that if I were to tell you some of the stories of my time, how old are you, if you don't mind my asking? I, I'm 139, be 140 and... 
few days. Then uh, I reckon that, um, forgive my presumption, you did mention you were a historian, but some of the uh, territories of my time might be a bit out of the ways of your experiences as well, at least to your friends. <laughs> yeah, you, you could say that. I've done my best to, you know, keep myself appraised, but geography does shift an awful lot. And what, may I ask you the same question? It's tough keeping track. Barovia doesn't have seasons the way you'd think it, and uh, the only way to track days here is by the moon. So, if I could reckon, though, I imagine I, I'm over somewhere, uh, somewhere between uh, 540, 560, somewhere around there. Well, it's an honor to get to speak to you then uh, and I, I will say that I truly appreciate you telling this much to a group of strangers you it's I, I, it may not seem as such but having a bit more grounding and what on earth's going on and where we are well uh, it means a lot please uh don't worry about it. I'm glad to do what I can. It, um, as I mentioned, there's not much for me to do aside from stocking up on some essentials and we're familiar with getting by on a little less than other folks. But, um, and at this point you hear the uh, whistling of the tea kettle. Uh, one moment, let me see if I can pour that out for you all. And uh, Casimir gets up and begins uh, pouring tea into the uh, individual mugs and letting it steep before handing uh, one out to each of you. In the time in between, Erthrandir gives a quiet look at Amity and Erthrandir and just hisses, or at Amity and Lullison and just hisses, Did we teleport? Lullison gives him the biggest shrug with, you know, just a very bewildered look. I did. Neverwinter Woods happen to be a wild magic zone. I mean, sure, why not? That doesn't make any sense. Also, if the mist didn't used to be here, or maybe there was just some of it, then maybe we can figure out where it came from. If, with, with your history, maybe you can help figure out when it appeared. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point. Like, if they, if they came, then they have to be able to leave. That, they, they, they're definite. They're not just a forever. Good thinking, Amity. Casimir returns with the mugs, placing one before each of you. Um, he seems pensive for the moment. Uh, if you'd like to speak further, you may. With given the silence, however, he looks up. No, um, I, I, I did actually. Uh, Casimir. Pardon, I have a small question. Of course, I uh, wouldn't mind uh, if it's something I can answer. You said that after your revolution, your folk surrendered, which, I mean, don't do what you need to to survive. I get that too well, but how'd you end up here with the Vestani? Just, I mean, I wouldn't think that would be a natural place for a political dissident to end up no that that's a fair question you see when um our people were found themselves at the brink of extinction uh, surrender was the last option we had whether it was by mercy or by a simple desire to trim the fat of what he was trying to do Von Zarevich left us to the care of the Vistani. They had been already taken care of some of the refugees of Von Zarevich's wars by that point. And they took us to the Valley of Barovia. By that time, it wasn't called Barovia. I'm not aware of the name, though. I imagine the folk who lived here before us had their own term for it. We were able to find refuge here with the Vistani and uh, 
order of knights that were still uh, doing their part to uh, resist Zarevich's efforts at expansion. Of course, that order didn't entirely last. Zarevich is... Uh, his bloodlust, his desire for more territory, and whatever, in my personal theory, is he felt uh, his father had been humiliated by too many years of enemies he'd refused to bow to his uh, throne. And now Strahd was eager to ensure that any last drop of rebellion was stamped out. We didn't join the efforts by that point. We were too few and we couldn't risk it, but... The Order kept fighting, trying to protect those remaining uh, refugees and others who were still fighting against Zarevich's army. Uh, it didn't last long. Strahd's entire campaign of conquest took around 14 months, I want to say. By the end of it, he'd conquered the valley we'd found ourselves in. Uh, he'd destroyed that order of knights and he'd um well he named it barovia for his father i figure he felt that he'd finally wiped clean whatever stains he felt had uh, accumulated on that dynasty erthrandir looks a bit sick so he sent you away you started building a new life and then he followed you here and conquered this too uh I suppose you could certainly say that, though. As far as I can glean, it was never the Vistani's intent to uh, take us to a place where he might follow. The man who took me in, uh, he was a good man. I uh, regretted to see his passing. Yeah, that's... that's knowing humans in a nutshell. Well, it's, that... uh... Unfortunate that not all his descendants might share Velikov's uh, particular nobility, but all the same, the Vasani uh, did what they could to keep us safe. And, well, they, uh, they advised us that it might be best to lay low, and we did what we could to ensure that we could carry on. Uh, I warned the uh, order that the resistance might be fruitless, but well, they kept fighting, and I can't entirely say I blame them. They knew what would happen when uh, Zarevich cornered them, and well, that's precisely what he did. I, I, well. Uh, <laughs> I suppose it was a bit of a kick of the teeth when the man couldn't even properly die then. <laughs> I'll say so. It was... Well... It's funny. Once he took power, he was tolerable, if nothing else. Barovia wasn't the hillscape I had feared. Looking at the... Looking at a dragon's bones will keep you nice and settled, and I imagine that's what Zarevich wanted. He kept to ourselves, and he left us as well as much alone. Others kept fighting, but... Wait, a dragon? <laughs> that was the name of the Order. The Order of the Silver Dragon. And they were actually no. led by a silver dragon. They just didn't like exotic heraldry. <laughs> well, I will agree that most of those, in my experience, do tend to be uh, promotional naming. But <laughs> in this particular case, uh, yes, it was quite the noble dragon, Argenvast. I had the pleasure of meeting him once or twice on my own. You he were... was a silver dragon. I, 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 I guess. Yes. 
but that is... And you have lived quite a life. That is incredible. <laughs> it's been... Well, it was a busy few years, I should say. Haven't had much happen in the past... Uh, he winces briefly. 350 or so. Can Aerithrim Deer see what he was feeling for that bit? Make an insight check. I'll try. Natural one. It's tough to say. Yeah. There's a whole number of emotions playing across his face, and it's tough to nail them down. Well. Oh. <laughs> I suppose but, after all you went through, a little quiet's not unwelcome. For sure, though. Of course, the quiet didn't last. Watching, um... Well, to answer your actual question, it was unpleasant to see that Zarevich could die and still endure as one of the undead. Yeah, I was... I'm honestly still quite looking forward to the day when the generals who orchestrated my particular brand kick the bucket. I'm waiting to pin that little article to my wall. Mm. Lillison looks slightly uncomfortable. It was a funny occasion. From what I'm told, it happened um, during a wedding of some kind though I'm not entirely sure of the particulars. Regardless, at the end of it, Strahd himself was dead and yet undead. And it wasn't soon long after that that the fog rolled in. We ain't had much contact with the rest of the outside world ever since. Wait. Wait, 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 wait. He, he looks at the others. So, you're telling me that time was the time when he became what he is coincided with the mist? I didn't find out till a bit of a time afterward that he'd uh, well, resurrected seems like too uh, pious a word to use but it was um, that same year, that same month Erythrindir's gone like deathly pale Wait. Oh no. Oh no, 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 no. They, they, he looks at the others. I, Amity, the little, the, the march. Or the, they, or, or the, somebody, I, back in Barovia Village, they said that, that he was tied to, or that he just kind of puts his head in his hands. If they're to, if they're connected, then Lillison, looking even more uncomfortable, uh, chafes at her arms uh, as if trying to get warm, and then takes a step closer to the fire. Um, Casimir, have you met a lot of people in the last fifty or so years, or have you mostly been living by yourself? I'm, I mean, have you met any other outsiders? It's rare that we get any outsiders coming through here. Um, we mostly try to keep to ourselves. It's um, not entirely safe to venture too far beyond the hillside. The Vistani see to that. Not as a matter of endangerment, but um, they keep an eye on us and ensure that we don't come into overmuch uh, trouble. From there, we... Uh, well, we try to stick to uh, the unspoken agreement we laid down uh, four centuries back. We keep to ourselves, and um, we don't hear too much from others. The last time we had an outsider pass through here it must have been a damn few decades. We've had others, folks, come to the uh, come to the tent up there, but. So often that I get folks in my own home. Well, I so you don't it. know any 
who, who've lived here for a while, maybe? Mm, not that I can say as such, no, from what I've heard from what the Vistani tales tell, from anything I've gleaned from them, outsiders don't tend to um... <sighs> he looks positively glum and apologetic. Uh, he kind of shifts a bit uncomfortably in his chair. Things aren't easy for them, I'll say. We've been nearly murdered like eight times in the past week you can you don't need to deflect for our sake of course are we putting you in danger by being here i don't suppose so um like i said we keep to ourselves and um as long as we don't uh, go too far beyond the beaten path we're safe as we are beneath the vistani's eye a few of my uh, men are out there right now uh, assisting them with some of their work, but it's all properly signed off on, so it's not something I'm overly concerned with. Straw or P hasn't given you any more trouble? As far as I can tell, he um, is more than glad to forget about us. And for that, I can't blame him. My people have had an awful lot taken away from us. I suppose there's only so long... A dog can chew on the same bone before there's no marrow left to suck. But you're still here. He... We're still here. That's nothing. That's no small thing. And yeah, you never... You never know. Even immortals don't live forever. We know that. There might be a day when you can... When we can have some brighter again. Be chuckles. Certainly wouldn't be um, the worst thing in the world. I've been... Um, Barovia is a land of dreams, you see, and um, it's hard for any of us to escape uh, the bad memories, the nightmares that a few too many years can send. I thought that uh, Zarevich took everything from me when, um, well. Might I presume that you have some uh, personal enmity for the man? Earthen Deer just rolls up his hair to show the two sets of bite, the set of bite marks on his neck. My condolences. I'm sorry that you've had such an encounter. I'm glad to see you seem to uh, still have your heart beaten. Um, <laughs> it was a close uh, thing, don't worry. <laughs> I hope that the others of you have not had to um, had such an encounter. And he kind of turns to... Um, Lilith and then Amity and Ismark and Irina. We've pretty much been sticking together the whole time we've been here. Well, well us three at least. Yeah. Yeah, they're good people. We uh, didn't know each other before this, but I couldn't think of doing this without them. He nods. I know that, um, well, he took, um, well, I, I know that you, um, earlier you seemed to be enjoying some of the, uh, sketches in, uh, the front entry of my home. They're beautiful, especially the stars. I've never seen that particular set of constellations before. Well, perhaps things can change over the course of a few hundred years. Uh, maybe it's just from a different perspective. Regardless, um, they weren't drawn by myself, but they were drawn by... Um, a close family member of mine. She was uh, a gifted artist, bright, uh, 
formidably intelligent. Um, uh, I've studied uh, my bits of lore in the arcane, and she terrified me in, in a good way, I assure you. She was precocious. <laughs> my sister Petrina, she was an artist, a scholar, and, well, quite the mage, uh, all wrapped up in one. Yeah, well, magicians are like that. You're never sure if they're going to perform a feat of wonder or burn your house down. <laughs> Wilson winces a little bit. <laughs> she was, um, well, after the Arthur the Field fell, she was what little I had left. And these sketches, as were what little she had left, they were her way of remembering what we'd had. She was she, um, very good. She was. Um, at least she was until the day that um, Zarevich uh, took the bone he'd been chewing on and cracked it open to take whatever else he'd uh, been able to suck out of it. Whatever little remnants of color we might have been able to have, that was... That was the day we lost a whole lot of what little hope we had left. If... If you don't mind... Uh, and of course we can you, you don't need to we you are not obligated to dump your sorrows before strangers but would you mind telling us what happened well it's a bit of a painful memory but suffice it to say that by the end of it my sister was dead and half of what remained of our people they butchered oh oh i suppose you might have noticed uh he says with a bit of an apologetic glance toward uh lilith and amity and uh irena uh, I assure you that it is not a uh, genetic composure of the Dusk Elf people for all of them to be male. Uh, oh. Oh, no. Oh, I am... I am so sorry. Amity glances at Lillison. Uh, how is she taking this? Lillison is staring into the fire and uh, every so often glances up in the direction where uh, Kiva and Metreon had gone up the hill. Um, well, uh, Erthendir is like, obviously... He was, throughout this whole conversation, you noticed that he was getting, like, more and more relaxed, cupping his tea mug in his hands, just kind of the most comfortable you've ever seen him. But now he's just staring at the, he's just staring at the wall. Uh, I take it it was a deliberate act then, a calculated one. You wouldn't be uh, overtly incorrect. It was, um, I suppose he viewed it as punishment for disobeying an order he'd given. It, but the thing that made it all the worse was the man who led it. I mentioned to you uh, Rahadin, the traitor general who had joined King Barov's armies. He's well, still alive? To this very day, at the side of the devil in Castle Ravenloft, 
It's by his blade that saw every one of my every one of the set of our settlement's sisters, wives, mothers, and daughters. Gone. By nightfall it was over. I'm so sorry. Um, again, I appreciate the condolences, um, though. It, hmm? if, if it's any small consolation, then elves live like freaking forever, right? So may, maybe someday an, an outsider elf will um, come through the, come here and be, be willing to help you. Lillison gives Amity a very, very sharp glare. I'm, I'm not saying it's necessarily one of us. I mean, you, you, there's like hundreds of years, right? Amity, I, I don't, don't, please, just don't. It's all right. I, I don't mind. It's just, I'm only uh, a bit familiar with the tieflings. Um, so I presume you're not overly old for one of your kind, but it can be difficult for someone who's lived as long as I have to see that thread of past to future. You're right that we could take on others and, well, if you're looking from a biological perspective, our settlement could grow and thrive, though, Barovia's. Perhaps and not the best place for such, but even if that were to be something that we could meaningfully achieve, even if it, we could find someone, the Dusk Elves are all but extinct, and as far as I know, what last survivors there were found their way here. You're right that we could see our way to see our settlement on for the future, but the stories we tell our children, the the rights we remember, the histories we tell. I know I said I wasn't much for histories, but losing that would be hard to hard to take. You you don't have to. I mean. Of course, there's uh, and and th there's lives you can never get back, and so much that is not reconcilable. Believe me, I know. I've tried. <laughs> Some things are just gone. But he nods. That doesn't. Even if it's not with the same folk under the same sky, then still a value in having them. I, I wouldn't presume to even begin to tell you how to how y'all should handle your perhaps, I don't know, close to the worst thing that could happen to anybody, but it doesn't you can still carry those on, even in a book or a play or a I don't know. It's important. Don't don't let yourself think that it isn't. He nods again. I appreciate the thought. Truth be told, it's difficult for old things to be forgotten, and it seems to be that that's doubly true in Barovia. You see, there's um one among the lives we lost that day that... Well, if there's to be any hope of a restoration, I would want on my side, and not just for the obvious reasons. Um, and funnily enough, in Barovia, it's tougher forgotten things to let themselves be forgotten. Dreams and nightmares have a way of lingering and souls doubly so. Yeah, oh. 
have y'all had a lot of those kind of dreams then? Stuff that doesn't come from your own memories? It took me a while to figure out if they were just memories or messages, but give enough repetition even enough like me can figure out what's going on. You see, I mentioned Petrina. Now, unlike uh, several of my fellow folk, um, her body alone was interred in someplace a bit more secure. It seems that uh, Von Zarevich was intrigued by whatever arcane prowess she displayed in life, and though she was already dead by then, he saw fit to put her up uh, below ground, deep in the catacombs of the castle itself. Ever since then, well, Dreams are the dialogue of a spirit. And it seems that my sister is not resting so peacefully as I would have hoped. But at the same time, if there's any way of restoring her and taking back what we once lost, of course I would leap for the opportunity, but doing so would be difficult. I, you're talking around something that I don't really follow. You say her spirit's been haunting you? Haunting might be uh, one way of putting it. Visiting, perhaps another. As I said, Barovia spirits have a way of not staying entirely dead. We've we've had experience. <laughs> I believe that what I've missed for so many years might be possible. That bringing her back might be, with the right tools and resources, might be achievable, but how is a tough call certainly as long as uh, von Zarevich remains the devil of Castle Ravenloft Earthendir's just like got his head cocked just kind of looking at Kazmir as he's kind of processing you there's folk in Barovia with that power. I, I, I didn't know there were religious folk of that strength around here, or druids or anything. He shrugs. It'd be difficult to find, but you never know. Yeah, well, if, when the bastard dies, then I hope you get the chance. That seems uh, mighty confident for a newcomer who's, um, if you'll forgive my tone, for a newcomer who's um, had a few unopportune run-ins. Nothing's eternal. Nothing lasts forever. Not men, not vampires, not empires, not memories. And but I... I think I might. And then he shakes himself. I'm talking nonsense. I, and you've been so courteous. Thank you. I, you've been a splendid host. And <laughs> he kind of tries to laugh, although it's obviously forced. <laughs> Given me a little taste of home. So thank you for that. Of course, you'll have to do what I can, and, um, well, if you hear a rustling of any folk who are looking to put an end to, um,
the current, uh, well, the Bloodsucker in Ravenloft. I wouldn't mind hearing about it. I'm not so sure things are likely to change, but... If you catch whisperings, I wouldn't mind knowing more. I think Thank you, you do that. for your hospitality. Um, you've mentioned dreams, like weird dreams, prophetic ones that come true. Or, or just dreams. He frowns. I personally have not had um, such prophetic dreams, but um, as far as I can tell, the ones I've had glean only some sort of communications uh, sent by my sister's uh, departed spirit. I've heard that uh, there are some around the Vistani that dabble in fortune telling and such, but I've never... Prophetic dreams, I suppose, are perfectly plausible. I know that I've heard some uh, rumors here and there of folk that, well, have glimpses of things that might be or that might have been. Like I said, Barovia is an old place, and it, uh, the way the mists rise around it, they tend, they tend to trap things in. Memory finds it tough to leave, and future seems to bend in on itself sometimes. Can't say I'm over much surprised if someone's been seeing such things. Do you maybe know of anyone else who has this kind of thing? I've already been bitten uh, twice now by not being able to interpret one in time. He shakes his head. I'm afraid not. Uh, it's not something I'm overly familiar with, though um, if you gave me a description of one, I could... I could suppose, but I'm afraid I'm not really... Uh, Equipped for the interpretation of um, dreams or the throwing of finger bones or any other means of those uh, telling the future. Amity looks at her companions. I, I don't know if we have any right now that we don't know how to interpret. Unless you had one last night, you were a little out of things. True, I was not here for the session last time. Uh, was there anything I should know about from the long rest? I listened to the episode, but... <laughs> I think you're good. All right, cool. Casimir shrugs and sits back in his chair, uh, sipping the last of his tea, which by now has cooled off significantly. Regardless, um, it is uh, nice to have guests and... Um, as mentioned, if you catch wind of any folk who are seriously considering uh, what you mentioned, I would be delighted to know. But in the meantime, I wish you well. Well, keep um, in touch. I'm certain that your time has not been easy thus far. It, it hasn't, but it's been a little easier in the past hour or so. Well, whatever I can do. Any smiles, nods... Um, and with that, we cut to the hillside. So before we do that, uh, can I yes. do one thing very fast? Um, you may, but we might have to adjudicate it. Uh, just what... So while the, uh, parting pleasantries have been going on, um, Lillison is going to very, very quietly, uh, in a corner, cast Sending to Kiva. And she is going to want to say, We've just learned that all these elves have had their women killed by Strahd. Be careful. Our host seems blasé to the whole thing, but... I don't know how any of the other men will react when they see you. So upon hearing that message, it's going to definitely startle Kiva because after this nice conversation with Metreon about <laughs> how we can- mind, uh, we'll Ooh. catch up to that in a few minutes. Uh, oh, okay. Still at the other timeline catch up. So, Time paradox. if you don't mind. So as Lillison sends the message, we turn away from Casimir's cottage and back to the rising path along the hilltop leading to the Vistani encampment. Uh, 
as Kiva and Metreon, as you see your traveling compatriots make their way around toward the south side of the hill, you make your way uh, following along Adrian and Elvier as their cart rattles, the wheels creaking and swaying slightly as it breaches the way to the top of the hill. Um, the one horse struggling a bit to pull the weight, but before long, you make your way to the hilltop itself, which you can see is covered with steaming piles of horse dung. You can see that more than two dozen horses are tethered to stone blocks inside the circle of wagons, but outside the tent. Most of the animals are draft horses, but a few of them are riding horses equipped with saddles. Adrian, turning to the two of you. Well, I suppose we should uh, take a look at um, what they've got in store. Since they've got a number of horses. You coming in? Uh, so, uh, as we're kind of preparing, um, so uh, here's a question, actually. Um, where where would uh, Kiva and I had been when we were discussing things? Were, were we on the path up to the camp, or? Um, so currently, you're on the path up to the camp. It doesn't take very long to get there. So if yeah, you'd like, you can have a brief conversation on the way. But Okay. Um, well, in that case, as we get closer to the camp, uh, I'm letting the Mardikovs take the lead on this, but uh, uh, Kiva kind of watches as Metreon sort of stiffens his posture and kind of shakes his shoulders out a bit, trying to almost like get into game face. And uh, he looks at her. Well, let's get us a way out of here then, shall we? Kiva smiles as politely and... Uh femininely, if that's a word, as possible, uh, to try to put on her own uh, version of charms and uh, also softens her posture where Metrian um, stiffens up a little bit to seem much more friendly than I'm sure she <laughs> normally does. <laughs> and then, yeah, uh, we follow the Mardikovs. All right. Uh, Elvira remains behind with the remaining horse. Uh, Elvira, or Adrian, making his way forward. You see, piled outside the tent are several empty casks of wine. From inside the tent comes the crack of a whip, followed by the howls of a young man. As you pass through the entrance, Adrian gives you a slightly concerned look, but by this point you can see to the inside. Three sputtering campfires fill the tent with smoke, and through the haze you see Vistani clustered in small groups on various places along the dead grass, some nursing cups of wine, others playing cards or staring into the fires. All look restless and have their gazes directed away from the center. There, a barely conscious and shirtless teenager hugs the central tent pole, his wrists bound with rope and his back streaked with blood. An older, larger man in studded leather armor lashes the young man with a horsewhip, causing him to scream again. Standing in the bigger man's shadow is a third man, also clad in studded leather. Easy, Bozer, he says to the whip-wielding brute. I think Alexei has learned his lesson. Uh, as soon as Metreon sees this, uh, he seizes up a bit at, at the sight of it and at the sound of it. Uh, but uh, he tries to kind of keep himself uh, grounded and looks to Kiva, though. Uh, and doesn't say anything, but sort of gives her this oh shit look. Yeah, Kiva um, hearing the sound... It's weird, she stiffens almost reflexively, like, with each whip crack, like, she's sort of used to it, and, um, definitely falters in her, uh, uh, I guess her guise of trying to be more friendly. She's definitely much more scared at this point. Um, she just sort of sticks closer to Metreon, um, in normally what would be a protective way, but in this time is more of a, I'm needing you to be protective of me now. Um, and goes to Adrian is just like, do we know where we're supposed to go for this? He remembers back. I'm not sure. And at that point you see uh, the big man holding the whip 
kind of grunt and turn to the uh, other armored man behind him with a grunt, the whip kind of trailing across the mulchy earth. You can see that he's, he kind of frowns, scowling for a moment, and then at the sound of your footsteps and voices turns to face you. You can see he's a massive bear of a man wearing a maroon stole with a golden thread and decorative patterns over a muddy gray tunic. His hair is greasy and unkempt and his beard short but shaggy. You can see large dark circles under his eyes that are somewhat bloodshot, even from this distance. He blinks toward you and glances toward the teenager strapped to the pole before shaking his head and handing the whip to the other armored man. He coughs, stepping forward. Good, mor good uh, morning. Welcome. Um, might I ask uh, your business here? Well, I hope we're not interrupting anything. Uh, I believe my companion here, and he, uh, Metron, points to, uh, uh, which Mordekov boy is it? Adrian. It, uh, points to Adrian. Uh, I believe uh, it, uh, my companion here was uh, in the market for, what, what was it again? We were looking to uh, purchase uh, one of your draft horses, if that would be uh, possible. The man uh, nods, kind of reaching up to scratch his beard. That should be possible. Um... Ergul, take care of him. And he glances toward the other armored man who nods and steps forward. This should not be an issue. If you are looking to purchase uh, horse flesh, then I would be more than glad to assist. Uh, the others of you, um, you were looking to purchase horses as well? You are all together, yes? Yes, well, uh, somewhat. Uh, and uh, you see that Metreon is kind of uh, sort of maybe sizing him up a bit. Uh, you can actually see that the man Aragal, he's of middling height with long chestnut brown hair that descends to his shoulder blades. He has a neatly kept mustache and a goatee and a glint in his eyes. You can see that he wears a long brown coat and a white shirt marked with dark lines and triangular patterns. And he has his eyes fixated on you intently. Metreon kind of bites his lip with, uh, with his gold fang and uh, uh, kind of snaps snaps out of it for a, bit, for a moment. But uh he looks up at him. Uh, well, we are looking to travel, yes. Uh, however, and uh, kind of motions to kind of pull him aside, if you don't mind. Aragol frowns and glances at Luvash, who grunts and steps toward the two of you. Um, he says, well, you don't know who's Luvash, but she says, Luvash, I, will, uh, I can handle the horse transaction if you would uh, care to handle them. Luvash kind of grunts uh, and steps toward you as Adrian gives you a somewhat help, hapless shrug and steps to speak with Aragal. The big man, Luvash, uh, makes his way over to you, um, towering over both of you by a good few inches. Right, you were looking for uh, some other business, uh, but not horses. What can I do for you? Drown stiffens up his posture again uh, and is uh, slightly disappointed. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, well, yes, uh, we've heard, we are, uh, uh, of course, uh, out of towners, uh, you should say, you could say. Um, and we have heard word that you all, the Vistani, have uh, the means to travel outside of Barovia. Is this true? Luvash's eyebrows go up. You would have heard, um, that we do have certain means available to us, perhaps. Were you perhaps interested in... Uh, well, by the look of you, I can see that you are uh, not native Barovians. I am not surprised that you might seek passage. It is a bit of a dreary land, is it not? You know, I... Quite dreary, really, yes. Unreally. I'm sorry, <laughs> Kiva, go on. No, she was just going to say that it's quite dreary, yes, and... Uh... If it is possible for you to transport goods in and out, um, perhaps it would also be possible for you to transport uh, people. <laughs> I can tell, look, looking at you, that you have a... Uh, <laughs> well, appearances aside, you are certainly no Barovian. But... Uh, in that matter, I think that it uh, certainly would be possible. We do have certain tools available to us. Tell me more about these tools. We have um, 
Well, if you would be interested in purchasing them, I would be more than happy to sell you uh, certain potions. If drunk, they protect against the poisons and the ill humors of the fogs that surround Barovia and allow ease of transport. You would be able to make your way through the mist to the other side quite unharmed. Uh, Metreon uh, kind of jolt, like his body kind of uh, uh, has this jolt uh, of uh, excitement when he mentions these potions and uh, escaping. Uh, he very carefully looks over at Kiva. Uh, what is Kiva? What is her reaction? Kiva doesn't react to the potions. She asked, she just says, um, sorry, I was more asking about uh, if you, the Vistani, could transport us out. Um, you go out to get wine and things, I've heard, so couldn't you take people out of the mists? The Vistani, we have a special uh, access to these particular items. But, um, if you're looking to make your way out of uh, the mist as well, we can make do by use of sharing these brews with you. So we do not uh, go in and out of the mist regularly. I could see to it that uh, you are able to obtain the potions, though. I'm afraid that uh, our folk here are quite otherwise indisposed. So unfortunately, you would likely need to make the journey yourselves, but we would be glad to provide any sort of direction. And people who've taken these potions before, have they made it out? Well, I've certainly not heard from them again, but in all seriousness, uh, we do have caravans that go in and out from time to time, and yes, the potions are quite well tested, I assure you. Kiva is talking to him. Uh, Mitreon uh, definitely wants to get a read on him, whether or not he's uh, he's either hiding something about these potions or is being truthful about them. Make an insight check for me. Arzur. Uh, that's a 14. 14? Seems to be forthright. Seems to ha be kind of relaxed, comfortable, uh, doing his best to deal with you in good faith, as far as you can tell. On shrugs. Uh, 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 while we would prefer a caravan uh, out of the mist, uh, what would it take to acquire these other resources? Well, if you're looking for uh, a potion for a means of escape, that would be... Was the two of you? 200 gold. It would actually be a fairly larger number than that. I'm sure we could come to some sort of accommodation, though. No? Well, uh, you have to understand that uh, the potions in question are a precious object to uh, our people. Uh, we are uh, travelers, many of us, and uh, I'm sure you understand that that uh, we cannot uh, depart from them so easily. 100 gold per person, and I would be more than glad to uh, see to it that you are safely on your way. Uh, the question for the DM, because I don't want to metagame here. Mm -hmm. So, we know from Ismark that the Vistani are sort of in with Strahd, but we don't know the particulars of how they're in. Correct. Okay. Um, that's still fine for what I'm going to ask. Um, so, the devil, um, I've heard, sort of uh, likes to associate with you. He can't be too happy that you're selling people these potions. Does he know what you're up to here? Oh, there shouldn't be a problem there. We, uh, we have an understanding. Not to worry. We, um, we ensure that, uh, the prophets are well invested in the Vistani community and uh, the particulars of all transactions that are not known at Castle Ravenloft, uh, well, the accountant of the castle does not need to know all that goes on. Hmm? It is not as if the taxman comes to the outskirts of Lockie quite frequently. Thank goodness for that. I would right? like to make an insight check on this one because she doesn't buy that Strahd is okay with this at all. Go for it. Uh, and as she's doing that, Metreon, uh, she would see it seems more eager than probably she is. But uh, go on. That's a dirty 20. Woo! Um, 
seems to be, you know, there's no hesitation in his voice, no quaver, you know, as, you know, it seems, he seems genuine when he's talking about, you know, Strahd being on the up and ups. This, you can tell me to fuck off with this question. Genuine in a, I have practiced this, practiced this lie way or genuine in a, I truly believe what I'm saying way. Um, I mean, there's no hesitation that, you know, currently he, you know, is, you know, being false to you or anything like that. But it doesn't seem okay. like it's rehearsed. Or does it? I mean, given that insight check, it's it sounds like a refrain that, you know, he's said more than once. Like he's selling like something. He's a salesman. Yes, yes. Okay. you are getting a mercantile vibe. Okay, understood. That's I'm. I just wanted to make sure that Kiva's suspicion was not delving too far into, like, my knowledge of things. So no, he seems he seems he, he, he seems to want you to buy these. But okay, yeah, you know, understood, understood. All right, so Kiva, um, knowing that, is going to just look over at Metreon and give what she is hoping is just sort of an imperceptible shake of her head. Um, she's not buying this, and I think it's probably clearer in her uh, expression and body language now that this is not something that she's particularly interested in anymore. Metreon sort of gives her a sigh and looks back at Luvash. Well, I would have to discuss with my companions to see whether or not the potions in question are a, uh, are a resource that we would like to all go in on. However, you said your travels are infrequent, but not completely at a halt. Uh, when would you say is the next uh, ride out? As far as that goes, I cannot completely say. Many of our, uh, the members of our caravans are otherwise uh, disposed at the moment. Um, but uh, folks come and go at times. I do not entirely control when that occurs. Perhaps you will see a wagon coming in or going out. I cannot say when. Let me speak plainly. What would it take for you to organize a caravan today? Today, that would be... Hmm. Well... The current circumstances make that a bit difficult. You see, many of our folk are... Uh, organized... Um, A bit of a searching party. Oh. So today would not be uh, particularly easy. Forgive me, though. It only takes one to to steer a cart, is it not? Uh, uh, my apologies if that's too uh, too forthcoming or too forthright, rather. He shrugs. I understand, but and you are welcome to ask around. But I do not believe that you would be. Uh, very fortunate in finding those that uh, might be interested in what you are seeking. But if you don't mind my prying even more, uh, you said a search party, then I assume that whomever you're searching for is of some kind of value to you, yes? Kiva immediately, um, and this time makes it obvious, elbows Metreon and shakes her head again. Metron ignores her. Perhaps if we assist in this search, uh, we can expedite these accommodations, and uh, perhaps, uh, you know, the sooner whomever you're looking for is found, the sooner we're able to travel. It really she is of the most so... importance that we get out of here as soon as possible. If that is what you are looking for, I could see it as possible. But uh, you might have some difficulty. My uh, friends have had some trouble. The, but if you would be able to find this particular missing person, uh, I would be greatly indebted to you. Who, who is this person? Uh, what a... Are they wanted uh, for any kind of motions over to the teenager uh, tied to the pole? 
are they wanted in that respect, or are they someone of more importance that you were seeking? No, not not in the slightest. He pauses for a moment. You notice, like his lip actually like wobbling for a second before he like sniffs loudly and pierces you with like a very fierce scowl. It is a little girl, my daughter. She has uh, gone missing, and it is currently our our goal to find where where, uh, she has gone. Metreon looks over at uh, Kiva, and there's just sort of this subtle, uh, kind of like when you you, uh, when you know that you're right, and uh, uh, he's kind of almost like gloating uh, silently towards her in a very subtle way. Oof, that's the wrong thing to do at this moment. Uh, if, if it's possible for a, a elf with blue skin to just completely lose all color in her face, uh, Kiva has done that at this point. Um, how old is your daughter? Livash closes his eyes. She is uh, seven. We've been trying to search for her. Um, we've had uh, no trouble or no luck yet. It's been little more than a day now, but if you would be able to find her, that would be a blessed boon. Enough for you to actually help us get out of here. I think that could certainly be arranged. Well, if you don't mind, uh, uh, Kiva, a moment. Hmm? Uh, Kiva just looks to Lavash and says, um, just give us one moment. If you didn't mind, uh, we'll be right back over. Of course. Not a problem. And yeah, uh, uh, Metron sort of steps away from Lavash and uh, Adrian. Uh, I guess he wouldn't be nearby. Maybe not. Who knows? Uh, but uh, he pulls Kiva aside to like an emptier... Uh, corner of the, the encampment. Come on, we, we, this is a this is our way out. And what happens if we can't find her, or we find her and she's already dead? I guess I wasn't thinking that far ahead, but we're good at these things, you know, uh, uh, right? Uh, we could do this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, the sooner we keep talking about it and draw flapping, uh, the more she's away. But you know, maybe we just say yes to this and. Uh, uh, I mean, you, you, you got you read on him, yeah. He's he seems, you know, maybe he's a salesman, but he seems pretty on the level. Metrion, I couldn't save my own daughter. What makes you think I'm capable of saving this man's? Because you have the rest of us. Look, I I don't know. I don't I don't trust him. I trust his loss, and I trust that he'd be appreciative of bringing his daughter back, but he did not seem too keen on being the one to escort us out of here. And who's to say that even if we bring her back, that this is just (laughs) another joke, another trick? I have to believe in something right now. We'd have to talk to the others first. It's fair, but I mean, if this is a missing missing person and you know it, 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 these woods is thick so I mean we gotta make this choice quick all right here's the deal if you go tell the others I'll try to get all the information I can about where she was last seen uh, where she could have gone who she was with maybe um, we can probably talk to the Martikovs about going with us at least while we have a cart fine but be nice yes of course i'll be nice all right well uh my good man uh, i leave you in the care of uh my good my good friend uh kiva here uh i will be back in just a moment if you excuse me and he kind of uh looks at you very pointedly uh kiva as he starts to make his way out of the camp kiva um walks back up to the and asks uh do you happen to have a place that we could sit down? Not as such, but um, if you'd like to take a seat, the grass is uh, dry enough. 
Excellent. These sort of topics tend to make me a little weak in the knees. Um, so she'll sit down and then wait for him to join her on her level. She doesn't want to be talked down to. He does so, uh, sitting cross-legged. He gives Look, a nod I'm... to some of the uh, other Vistani around the campfire, and they just wordlessly get up and move away. Well, that's very nice of him. Um, Kiva um, moves in close enough to be familiar, but not obviously enough that any sort of touch or anything could happen. But um, she does say, look, I'm going to be quite honest with you. Um, my own daughter is uh, dead. So I can't lie to you and say that your story doesn't touch me in a way that um, I don't think I was prepared for. But if we're going to do this, um, I need some information. Uh, anything you can tell me about her. Uh, where she was last seen, who she might be with, people who have a grudge against you or your family, identifying marks, what she looks like, and we're going to need the help of the people that you have already out looking for her. He nods. Um, sorry for your loss. Um... Arabelle is a beautiful little girl. She's, well, raven black hair like a frazer, um, skin uh, uh, more like uh, alabaster than the uh, pale Barovian's um, soulless lot. Um, she's uh, a smart girl, uh, precocious, right, and... Um, it was um, a certain man's responsibility to keep watch of her, but that did not go as expected. And he shoots a very venomous glance at the teenager strapped to the pole at the center of the tent. Kiva gives a um, very, very cold look over to him as well. Um, now understanding why he is there, uh, this perhaps hits a bit of a nerve to her. At the time, I was otherwise elsewhere, and Aragul, my brother, was away on his own business. We, I had asked Galaxy to watch my daughter. He utterly failed to do so. At the time, I had finished the need to buy business. The little brat had let my little girl vanish into the woods. Where she went, I don't know. Where she's gone, I don't know. Whether she's safe, I don't know. I know this is probably hard, but can you tell me where she and Alexi were at the time that she went missing? Was she in the camp or was she further away? I found Alexi uh, searching the pass at the base of the hill. Seems that she was playing them by the trees. Didn't bother more than that. The, the little brat couldn't tell me anything more useful. I've sent people all over the woods nearby. We've even taken a few of the elves and they've been able to uh, help with some of the efforts, but... They found nothing so far. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry for all of these questions, but it's helpful to know. Is there any place that you might have told her to go if she was in trouble? If something happened to you all here, a, a safe place to meet up somewhere else um, out, of, out of the encampment or um, maybe a place that she could go to hide if something were to go wrong? He frowns and shakes shakes his head not uh, nearby no um the lucky is not a uh, place that uh, we are particularly welcome um there's the only other nearby uh, structure um is uh, one that she would know at all costs not to go to um, Can and i don't want to me? think about how much further she could have gone okay why don't you tell me about the structures nearby any other landmarks uh 
identifiable places that she might go, um, that she know you might be looking there? That I... It is difficult to say. Um, as far as I know, um, one of the... Uh, well, in this area, of course, there's uh, Velaki. I have uh, sent some of my men to investigate uh, the uh, old cottages outside of the walls. Beyond that, uh, as well as to just explore the woods, the trees, whatever we can find. Um, I think one of the elves went over to the old mansion out to the west, but I hope she's not gone there. It's not the place we try to uh, take a look at. Um, and regardless, I don't think he would have even gone inside. But can you tell me about the mansion? It's an old place. Uh, bit of a ways west from here. Old and decrepit, uh, rotted away, but like I said, she would not have gone there. Uh, it is quite, uh, it is known to be uh, quite haunted. And he gives you kind of like a, a kind of humorless grin. I would not want uh, for my uh, daughter to uh, run into any angry spirits, and I'm certain that she would be smart enough not to do the same. No, she would not be there. Okay, and um, in the time that you've spent with her here, um, do you go on walks in the woods together? On occasion, yes. Um, only a few of the nearby hunting trails. Um, we've not gone further than that together. Um, okay, she yes. has mostly uh, kept to the hill. She has not uh, traveled far uh, to the edges of Barovia, no. Okay, uh, just trying to see if there's any place that she might have a fond memory of with you. Um, how long ago was she taken? Or gone missing? It has been a little more than a day. As far as I am told, she uh, vanished uh, yesterday morning. Uh, she had gone down to play a little after dawn, and uh, I saw Alexi uh, not long after. Without her. And he didn't say he saw anything suspicious or odd. He just lost a girl. The little brat wasn't paying attention. Doddling off and doing his own thing. Smoking pipe with her drinking, no doubt. Okay. Um, this While is watching all... my daughter. The information's all very helpful. Um, we, uh, we just left, um, well, the city, and, um, we're on the way to, to Kresk. Um, we just, look, I just, I need to know, um, and I need to warn you that if we find her, it, it might not be in a, in a way that you want her to be found. He closes his eyes. If you can find my missing daughter, then if you can bring Arabel back to me, I just want to know what happened to my little girl. I want her to bring home safe if I can. And if you lay a hand on her head, I will see to it that you are. She I side. would never. I just want... Look, like I said, I lost my daughter. I couldn't help her. So I know what it's like to be too late and to live with that regret. And I don't know you from Adam, but I, I just wanted to warn you that... Um, I'm going to try my hardest for her. But I can't guarantee that what's done is not already done. But I can tell you that I will bring her home to you, no matter what. He, uh... looks at you for a moment. Tell me. When, and... Forgive me if this is too cutting. When your daughter passed, 
I presume you uh, shed tears, yes? You cried for what had taken place. I was angry. Uh, I don't think I cried until uh, long, long after. Good. Then you have some knowledge of what I shall feel. They say that uh, many Barovians feel no tears, feel no rage, only fear. There's little one can do without a soul, but Evastani, I assure you that I am in full retention of every one of my facilities, and if my daughter is lost to me, then I will cry, yes, but I will feel that rage first. So please, bring my daughter home alive. Um, I'll try. I'll try. Good. And it is at this point, uh, Kiva, that you receive a message uh, from Lilith's message spell. Uh, Kaya, what is the message, if you wouldn't mind reminding us? I don't remember the exact wording of it, but I will try to convey the same information again. Um, Go for it. And this was this was the message spell, right? Not sending? This was message, yes. Gotcha. Kiva, we've learned that all of the Dusk Elf women were killed by Strahd's orders. Our host seems rather blasé to this, but I don't know how the other Dusk Elf men will react when they see you. Be very careful. Kiva looks, like, very scared for a moment, um, and then realizes that she's Still with Uvash and Lillison is nowhere around. Um, a lot of information for her to process all at the same time. Um, but she then looks to Luvash once she's understood what Lillison has said and said, um, I have one more question for you, actually. Of course. What would you ask? Uh, am I safe here? With the Dusk Elves. He raises an eyebrow. Safe as the Dusk Elves. They keep to themselves. They, uh... I don't see why you would not be. They, uh... A bit of a sad and uh, pathetic people, but... I doubt they would be dangerous to themselves, let alone anyone else. Oh, man. If anything, that makes her more suspicious of Lillison. Um... Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. She'll stand back up and offer a hand as sort of like agreement of what they've discussed. Um, and then she'll just say, no matter how we bring her back, please consider helping us. I, that's all I can ask. He considers you for a moment. Make a persuasion check. Oh, I'm really good at those. Yeah, that's a 12. He regards you levelly, uh, a bit of a shadow over his eyes, and just grunts. If you are capable, then you will bring her back to me soon. And he just nods and turns away. Kiva is very frustrated, but um, does not want to show it. So she tightens her hands into a fist and uh, goes back over, um, I guess, to Adrian and or wherever we said we'd meet up with the others. So probably the cart with uh, the other Martikov. All right. Um, as you make your way out, you see um, Adrian finishing up a conversation with Aragil, um, who nods. You see uh, Adrian takes out a small pouch um, and hands it to Aragil, who accepts it. Um, you hear the sound of coins jingling. You hear Aragil say, Very well, I shall uh, see to it that uh, it is prepared. Give me a few minutes, and uh, we will set you on your way. Good day. Uh, he steps away, and Adrian turns to you. How did it go? 
Uh, I suppose I have one more favor to ask of you, Adrian. Of course. Uh, what, what is it? The man, Luvash, his daughter, is missing. And he's asked us to bring her back, potentially in exchange for passage. We won't survive on our own, not without transport through the woods. If you can hold off going to the winery until we find her, she's only been missing a day. I would be uh, ever more in your debt. He frowns and then nods. I think that you're, uh, you'd be capable of making your way along the road yourself, but... Hmm. At the same time, I'm a bit concerned. Uh, make a persuasion check for me. Yay! Um, oh, that's a nine! Even better! I love that high charisma. <laughs> he sighs, uh, and then looks up at you with a bit of a sad smile on his face. Look, I... I think that you're more capable than you realize. Um, I'm glad to provide whatever directions you desire, but I'm sorry, I'm just, from what Amity shared and what we know of the, of the forest folk, I'm just, I want to make sure that my family's safe. I'm sure you can understand that. Of course. Uh, of course. Of course, and, God, uh, Kiva wants to punch something right now. <laughs> all right, and uh, with that, Adrian uh, makes his way back toward the wagon with you. I'll be waiting here um, uh, for, um, uh, I think his name was Aragold. He said he would bring out uh, a new horse, um, and we'll be on our way. Uh, I saw Metreon heading down the hill earlier. I presume you'll be joining him? Yeah, um... If this is where we part ways, then it's uh, it's been a pleasure. So it has. Um, best of luck out there, and the winery will always um, will be glad to welcome you for what you've done for us. Take care of your family. I uh, hope we'll be seeing you soon. He smiles. And you yours. It's mutual. Safe travels, Kiva. And he makes his way toward Elvira on the cart. Kiva will split off and ponder uh, his use of family uh, in regards to her group and uh, go meet back up with the others. All right. And as Kiva makes her way down the hill and Metreon steps into Casimir's home, we'll take a break. All right. Ooh. We have a lot of information. So you do. We have a quest hook. <laughs> I know. Congratulations. When did we get those? We didn't even need a paladin for this one. Also, man, has anyone else uh, played uh, Until Dawn? Not yet. No. Or like watched it? Yes. No? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. You know that like moment where like it's got like that butterfly effect? Like you saved this yep. person. As such, yep. this person didn't die. Amity told uh, Davian about the dream. As such, Adrian did not return with you to, uh, did not wait for you at the Vasani encampment. Look. <laughs> Man, it's fine. We'll be fine. We'll go we'll rescue right. her. We'll bring her back alive. It's going to be great. Everything's going to be fine. It's going to be great. Uh, Beautiful. You'll keep. You'll stop keeping uh, Aragal from me. Uh, oh, everything will be fine. <laughs> I mean, you have to find her first. You don't have to <laughs> like. Yeah, but we have the power of friendship, so. Yeah. There you go. Power Where of friendship. Be? Where could she be? Did and you hear on... me? Did you... Yep. <laughs> oh, never mind. What? I'll what? talk to you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, as we uh, forestall this episode of... Um... Fuck, what's that one show of like that like secret agent woman who likes all over the world and like you have to shut up? It's Carmen Sandiego. Carmen as we forestall this Carmen episode Sandiego. of Where's Carmen Sandiego, uh, we will pick this back up after a 15-minute break. Uh, until then, as always, do enjoy a few other messages from our D&D community. Uh, including a fireside chat this week with our very own Twy, who plays Aerithrim Deer on Twice Bitten, about running and adapting random encounters in your Curse of Strahd campaign. Thank you all, and we'll see you back here soon.
Welcome to Fireside Chat, a short interlude with weekly features, where I, your host Jip Lucas, will be showcasing and interviewing prominent D&D creators. This week, we are talking to Twy, the player of Erfrendir in Twy's Bitten, about creating better random encounters. Random encounters are often seen as pointless or a waste of session time, especially in story-driven games like Curse of Shroud. Why do you think they're valuable? So, what I've come to love about random encounters is that they throw me off my game. I'm a very planning-oriented DM. I love to make my players a detailed, vast playground and then let them mess around in it. As long as they're still, you know, following along the tracks I've set down. Not railroad tracks, but, you know, there's a road. You should follow it. And what random encounters do for me in that respect is they make me let go of control. Make me say, all right, I may think I know what is going to be the most absolute best thing that can happen in this session, and I might be wrong. So I'm going to leave that up to a dice roll, and we will see what my players engage with. Sometimes I find that, no, they really aren't too interested in the random encounters, and they'd rather much get to the content I prepared that day. But other times, other times that becomes some of the best sessions of any campaign I've ever run, and I think that's important. The possibility for a DM to have a controlled problem, something that they aren't expecting, and they aren't fully prepared for that session, but is happening anyway. I think having moments like that are super valuable. In addition, random encounters are opportunities for two of the three pillars of 5e D&D. Exploration and combat are very important parts of the experience, and I think we often forget that randomness and kind of, you know, what we can get with our players while they're wandering through a dungeon or wandering through the wilderness allows us to sate their hunger for those pillars as well. So it's not a matter of every fancy courtly ball you want your players to go to has to be interrupted by an assassination. It can be, all right, it can just be social intrigue when we get there because we had our fill of murder on the way here. And I don't mean that in a glib way, I mean that it's important to keep those elements in line. The joy of discovery, the joy of mastery over combat, and the joy of socialization and role-playing, those are great. Keep those in there. And speaking of discovery, that's the other thing random encounters do great. They allow for actual mystery in a way that even the most well-crafted plot lines you put together can't. There's a real sense in which a party that goes into a dungeon and runs into a different random encounter than a, a party that did it the exact same way is having a fundamentally different experience. And that registers with players more than you'd think. That's important, and I will give you an example of why in a moment. How can random encounters help create a tone in a horror-oriented D&D game? Simple. Learn to fear the woods. Your mileage in a horror game is predicated on how much you can deliver threats and then follow up on them. If you start saying the world outside the PC's island of safety is a horrible, ravening place full of monsters and terrors beyond comprehension, then you need to be able to follow up on that. One way to do that is with random encounters. And now, it's easy to say, well, but why would I let a random table do that job when I can just say they run into horror when I want them to? And I don't mean that cynically. But the thing about it that most people don't think about is probabilities. Randomness means that your players aren't always going to meet the big monster. Sometimes they're going to meet tracks the big monster left. Sometimes they are going to meet as was in the case of my Curse of Strahd game, a half-dismembered cow skewered 20 feet up a tree because the rock had dropped it there after flying back to its nest. And that happened at that time instead of them running into the rock itself because of the dice. And to a DM, that may not seem that important that, you know, the player's safety depends on a dice roll, but to a party, especially one that's been getting a little jaded with horror and thinks that they're going to be okay because the DM sets the path out in front of them, it can be the, just the shot in the arm your campaign needs. 
For a Curse of Strahd game, how would you change the random encounters in the module to make them work better? For Curse of Strahd specifically, I have a number of gripes with the module, which kind of boils down to this simple thing. The encounters in the module are splendid for setting tone, but they do it in the wrong way. So most of Curse of Strahd's random encounters, both on the road and in Castle Ravenloft, are either short, brisk combat encounters, or things you run across, mostly the former. There's a lot of bats, there's a lot of revenants, there is a lot of you run into a monster that is definitely spooky, but is also probably either five levels above or below you. It's mostly below, especially in Ravenloft. And that's not fun. The thing about combat, especially combat in a horror-oriented game, is that it needs to fulfill one of three things. Interest, emotion, or danger. If your party's fighting six wolves for the third time in that campaign, then they're not interested, because they've run across this danger before. They're not afraid, because they're wolves and they're level six and one fireball deals with that. And they're certainly not emotional, because, well, what's the reason to be? They're not afraid. They can deal with it. Now, that's not my endorsement to just start throwing zombie beholders and albaleths at your party willy-nilly. Although if you want to, go nuts. But it is an endorsement of lowering the number of your combat encounters by a lot. If you have 10 spaces on a random encounter table, maybe five of them should be combat. And those five? Those should be nasty. They should be hurtful. They should make the players fear for their lives, their characters, and they should tie into those other two pillars of either eliciting an emotion, whether it be fear, pity, what have you, there's a lot of means to do this, or they should be somehow interesting. If it's, say, oh, oh, we've run across some mutated twig blights in the woods, maybe we need to go back to Yester Hill to figure out what's going on. The other way to make Curse of Strahd better? Exploration. There's so few exploration encounters in Curse of Strahd, and it drives me mad! The cool thing about Barovia, as opposed to, like, many other settings that I've run, is that it has history. It is a setting about the history. It is dripping in it. But it never, ever delivers any unless you talk to very specific NPCs or read specific books. If you've got five other spaces on the random encounter table, then make those exploration-oriented. Have your players run against a old outpost of the Silver Dragon, where a bunch of revenants fought their last stand many years ago before getting up again. Have them run across a village that can't be sustained anymore because Barovia's population's gone down so much. Have the little grove with a gazebo where Sergei and Tatiana met. Don't rely on the story to come out when you think it's gonna come out. Just give it to them in bits, in bursts, in times you're not expecting it. Because if that encounter is interesting, it may spark something that you aren't expecting, depending on your player's emotional state, the state in the campaign, and that creates one of the greatest joys in D&D, which is spontaneity. And that is a beautiful thing. What's the one piece of advice you'd give to a new dungeon master who's looking to incorporate randomness better into their game? Randomness is as interesting as your ability to run with it. If you think that your encounter that you've made, your custom 10 encounter table, all of them meticulously made, is hot shit, but your players breeze past it in five seconds, you take a deep breath, you go swear in the bathroom, and you come back and you say, all right, so next. Because the nature of random encounters means they are meant to be eluded, or stealth past, or just walked right by. It sucks when it happens, and it will happen, but you've got to let it, because otherwise it's not really a random encounter, it's just an encounter that you didn't have happen for real. Part of the joy of random encounters is letting it go, and acknowledging that, alright, I don't know what's going on, and that's okay. It's gonna be fun.
friends. It is I, Count Strad von Zarovich, and I bid thee listen. The Guild of the Black Crow have produced over five hours of ambient sound design for my most beautiful and ancient land. As used by Twice Bitten, these ambient backgrounds include my most private and intimate of letters, as well as bonus tracks not found in the Dungeon Master's handbook. So, hear me now. I guarantee you safe passage to their camp. Support them, and perhaps we shall meet sooner than you think. And welcome back to Curse of Strahd, Twice Bitten. As always, some quick announcements to get out of the way before we get started. As always, thank you to Foundry VTT, our continuing virtual tabletop sponsor for the campaign. Highly recommend you check them out. Uh, they are fantastic and top tier. Um, second, just a brief shout out to, um, I don't think we've mentioned this yet. We've mentioned this on the subreddit in, in our Twitch credits, but... We've gotten a lot of questions about the uh, artwork that we use for the scenes on the show. Um, barring the uh, main title page that you're looking at now, um, all of the artwork that we've used comes from uh, Bro Chief or James RPG Art. Uh, he has a Patreon, uh, does some fantastic animated artwork. Uh, I think he just released the uh, art for the Burgomaster's Mansion in Velaki one week after we uh, were there ourselves, which is, you know, a sad day. But 
He does great stuff. Highly recommend you check him out, as well as all the other great uh, creators who have contributed or supported uh, this stream in any way. Um, so, uh, before we dive back in, uh, Twy, I think we've got some actual Twitch updates. We do. We have new emotes, kids. If you subscribe at Tier 1, you can see that we have two of the Curse of Straw Discord's most popular emotes, and also two I love dearly, which are Doru, for all your Home Alone needs, and Morgantha, for when either we meet the hags or when we wander across something that we really shouldn't, but we're all pretending not to know. It's a great one. And also at Tier 2, we have the man, the myth, Strahd himself. Which, you know, how could we have a Curse of Strahd stream without a Strahd emote? This is vital. So, you can get these with a Twitch subscription, which you can get either through, of course, a regular per month payment, or if you have Amazon Prime, odds are you've got Twitch Prime floating around. We would really appreciate that, and all the money from subscriptions and things like that go back to supporting this stream and making it as good as it can be. Serena? Absolutely, and uh, actually, before we switch over real quick, um, I... Just want to mention that I think Amazon Prime only does gets you the first tier, which would get access to Doru and Morgantha, but I don't think Strahd, correct me if I'm wrong. Nope, that's correct. Uh, and secondly, uh, when you mentioned Home Alone, I suddenly had this vision of Macaulay Culkin uh, playing, just being a character in Curse of Strahd, and I just wondered to you know what wonderful things would happen. It'd be great. I want to see, I want to see uh, Kevin, McCall McCall Kevin McAllister versus Strahd. <laughs> One time, Strahd actually gets willingly invited into someone's home. McAllister would just set up in the Amber Temple and befriend everyone there, and then just dare Strahd to come to him. I dig it. All right. Yeah, but how yeah, funny would it be to see to see Strahd get hit in the head with a full paint can? Be the real death house. Mix some holy water in there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes, uh, Serena, what you got? Well. If you are enjoying what we have done so far and all of our fun little discussions as a cast, you can join the discussion yourself on our very own subreddit, r slash twicebittendnd. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch all of our past sessions, fireside chats, video essays, and highlights from the stream. Remember to follow us on Twitter, too. We're almost at 400 followers. At hey. uh, DND, thanks. Beautiful. And thank Sorry, you twice very much, COS Serena. on Twitter. Twice oh, there you go. There you go. Twice Twitter. Bitten COS. And it's there on the, uh, on the little card thingy on the stream if you're watching this visually. Uh, anyways, uh, awesome. Excellent. Thank you all. And I think that is all we have for now. So without further ado, um, let's dive right back in. And so... Erthrandir, Amity, and um, Lillison, as you reflect uh, immediately following your conversation with Casimir about his uh, sister and his history, um, Metreon, you make your way down the hill and going by memory, uh, are you making your way to the house where the others are? Uh, yeah, I mean, I I know the direction they went in. I, I don't imagine I know the specif uh, the specifics. Eh where they're exactly at. Um, so as I'm sort of walking down the hill, um, uh, I'll go down there. Do I see the same uh, elves that we saw when we first got to the camp? You do, yes. They seem to still be stationed outside of the houses. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, I'm looking for my companions, you know, the ones I came with, uh, uh, the red tiefling, the other elves, half elves. He frowns and nods toward you. Uh, haven't seen them leave yet. I uh, imagine you'll find them at uh, Casimir's home, south uh, side of the hill. Oh, well, bless you. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, if I'm looking at the direction, it's just his house. There's no other houses, right? Uh, there are a number of houses, as you can see, around the base of the hill. But um, from what you can tell, there's just one house at the very southern end. Okay. Oh, bless you. Thank you. Uh, and he kind of air pats uh, the elf's shoulder and he'll go ahead and uh, saunter down there. Um, are there any more elves kind of hanging out outside or is it just kind of quiet right now? There are. You can see, in fact, that um, there is, outside the door of each house, there is a single grim gray cloaked figure. But you don't see any others uh, out by the tree line or uh, around the outside of the houses just seem to be these uh, singular guards. 
Although as you make your way around the south side, you can see outside of the southernmost cottage, what you presume to be Casimir's, there are three uh, guards instead of one. All right, yeah. Uh, Metron will very carefully uh, move in that direction uh, when he gets to the door, uh, seeing the three guards. <sighs> Hello, hi. Uh, I'm here to see my companions. I know they're in, an, uh, they're in a meeting of, of some kind with, uh, I believe his name is uh, Casimir? He uh, gives you a odd look and just nods. All right. Um, he opens the door and you can proceed in if you'd like. Spirited folk you are. And uh, he heads in past them. All right. Uh, the rest of you hear footsteps entering and the door close. Uh, Metron, you can see the same vestibule with the curtains. Um, and you hear uh, Metron, you hear a voice from the other side. Uh, uh, come in. Uh, yeah, Mestrian blows past all the different tapestries and statuettes and just kind of heads into the, the parlor. Oh, uh, it's good to see you all here. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, my lord, uh, we've got uh, some business to take care of. And uh, Metrion very urgently starts to usher them towards uh, the door where he's at, the entryway. Hey, hey, hold on. Erythrindy is like very slow to get up, just kind of looking dazed. Hey, with, with business? What are you talking about? Yes, yeah, so say, say, good, say goodbye to the nice elf. Uh, and uh, shall we? Uh, and Metron starts to kind of like very obviously start pointing towards the front door. He, Erythrindir looks kind of helplessly at Casimir. I, I hope to see you again uh, soon. I'll, I'll be there to take care and have a good day. Casimir nods. Of course. And uh, I'm sure I'll, uh... well, perhaps I'll see you again sometime. Yeah. But if uh, I don't, then uh, I wish you the best. Yeah. Keep the tea. Thank you. Yes. He looks uh, genuinely touched for a moment. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah. You're you're welcome. And Erethan just kind of turns away, and Mamity can and you all can probably see him just rubbing away something in his eye before he kind of heads out the door. Yeah, Amity probably headed out the door first. Like, you know, it, it was nice to see you, Casimir. We're going to see you again. Uh, but it's, from the way he's talking, it sounds like someone might be in trouble. So Amity uh, rushes out and um, you, basically the first quiet point possible asks Metreon, like, what, what's wrong? What's going on? Uh, Metreon's waiting for Lilith and the other, others. But, yeah, uh, Arthur uh, comes out. Yes. Lillison's going to hang back a moment, um, take another look at the tapestry, then uh, smile at Casimir, and just say very quietly, I'm so sorry. And he offers you a small, sad smile, and just nods in acceptance. And uh, then she's going to uh, follow everybody up. And yeah, uh, Metron will follow kind of... Uh after Lillison, and as he steps out, uh, kind of shakes it off. And when he's further away from, uh, he'll start to guide the party further away from the guards. Um, and as he does, uh, kind of looks back, doesn't look back at them, but speaks back at them. Uh, he was pleasant, wasn't he? Sounded like someone died there. But anyway, uh, yeah, so we've got, uh, we've got a thing, an arrangement that we might be able to capitalize on. Uh, so one of them, Vistani, uh, they've got someone missing. And uh, if uh, we find them, we can get out of here. Go on. That's just really all I know. Uh, I, f I think it's uh, uh, someone's kid or something. But uh... yeah, uh, that's all about once Kiva is back with the party, she can also explain things. I don't know where she is in relation to everyone else, though. I hope uh, Kiva is still speaking with Luvash at this point. She'll be down in a few minutes. Okay. They they said they'd take us out. Oh, all right. That's uh, good to know. That's uh, kind of looks at Lawson. Amity, that if if they've got, I guess that makes sense. If they've they're intertwined with Strahd somehow, then maybe they have the power. 
I'm trying not to think about it too much. You know, if, if we just kind of focus, keep our heads down, uh, we find this little girl. Uh, he, yeah, all right, sure. Let's do that. Let's go. What, 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 what do you mean, sure? You know, what's, this, what's this hesitation here? Barathrandir just kind of looks at Matreon and his eyes are dead. I can explain, which is going to take about two hours, and or we can go and get something done. Yeah, that's true. you rather. Great. Let's go do that. So, Kiva, uh, where do we want to start? Kiva is not currently with you. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought she was with us. Sorry. Um, I so guess yeah. we wait for her. If if there's a moment, um, Lillison's going to take a few steps away uh, from everybody and then uh, just sort of like look over at Erythrindir with a concerned expression. He's kind of playing with the, with the sending stone around his neck, just kind of twisting it and his knuckles on the grip have gone white. I notice you didn't tell him about Ofstra. That's not my job. I'm there to listen, to understand, and not to judge. I, he doesn't, my personal baggage, insofar as he asks for it, is immaterial to the job at hand. Do you really believe that? I... No. But... That's not the point. Doesn't matter if I believe it or not. I gotta... Let him tell his story. Keep in my memory. Write it down. Normally I'd have a recorder or two to put it, but... Weren't that lucky this time, so... It's fine. It's... He doesn't need to know. He... <laughs> uh, he, he does not need a second massacre to carry with him. Or, from the sound of it, or the way he talked about it, a third. It's not his problem. And it is yours to carry everybody else's sorrows? Don't, don't, I, look, I, it's not that simple. It's not just, oh, well, you gotta take responsibility for every, it's, it's my job. This is, if I don't carry this stuff on, you heard him. You heard how he talked about the other folks there. Nobody, when these folks die, they die. They're just gone. There's not going to be, even if some of them decide to have kids or adopt or whatever, it doesn't. They've given up. I can't be a responsible person and just let that go. Just say, all right, you mattered once, but now you don't anymore. Have, have fun being literally a footnote. I'm going to go do my own thing. I know. I know it is your job and your responsibility to record that, but it's not your job to plead for them. <sighs> nah, I'm not that much of a fool, but, uh... <laughs> well, at sometimes, that's kind of unavoidable. You know, if maybe I were a historian of festivals and you know nice things about culture that's what everyone thinks the job is you know like you you, you learn about people's prized pie recipes and the time their grandmother won a fencing championship or whatever but like everybody wants to do that everybody wants to know that people who weren't involved want to know that everybody wants that they don't want the other stuff nobody does so if you're if I if you're gonna tell me that like, okay, maybe I don't have a responsibility to bleed for him. I'm not a masochist, but 
The kind of stuff that I need to keep requires a lot of bleeding. <laughs> Unless I have a heart of a rock, then there's not really another choice. It is a choice. That's all I'm saying. It's not the responsibility you signed up for, but it's the man you are, I suppose. He nods. Yeah. It's not lucky and it's not fun and nobody says thank you, but um. I don't think I could do anything else. Well, what's a what's a third genocide for the pile, honestly? <laughs> and he just kind of starts laughing, but it's a sort of desperate sound. There's no humor in it whatsoever. As oh. they've been talking, uh, Metron's been kind of keeping his himself away from them towards Amity, uh, and without looking to her, just sort of keeping his eyes on the two of them talking. Uh, he goes to Amity. What do you think they're talking about over there? Um, so, you might have missed it, but or you did miss it, but when we were talking to Casimir, it seems that there was something horrible that happened to the elves here. And, um, well, it, it, it's, it's similar to what Ethrandir was telling us about his own past. Yeah, it is a right proper shame. Hey, listen. Um, so, uh, uh, I feel Kiva in. Uh, but keep your eye out on that, uh, that one over there. And he kind of nods his head towards Lilton. What, what do you mean by keep my eye out? Of, uh... So you know how you've been having dreams, right? Right. Well, you ain't the only one who's been having dreams. You and, do? Uh, well, not like yours. Uh, mine are a bit different, but... You know, they, they, they apparently tell you things, and uh, those things seem to be true. At least for you, they are. So I, I don't see a reason why mine wouldn't be, but... I've been, I've got on good uh, intel that uh, something, something's up with her. I don't know if it's bad or not, but it's worth keeping your eye out open. And uh, yeah, just, just, you know, if if she seems off, seems strange, or off, off her and more stranger than she usually is, just uh, you know, let me know. All right. Do, do you have any idea, like, more specifically, what, what do you mean by up with her? Like, is, is she lying to us about something, or is she sick or in danger? Uh, sick's one way to put it. Uh, and he kind of leans in, uh, turning himself away from the two uh, elves, or half-elves, rather. Um, uh, so, I don't I don't think she just got hurt back in that house. I think she's a little bit more like what we've been seeing, you know. Those things that uh, that attacked us back at the inn. But, you know, more composed, better. Oh, oh, are you saying that, that she's a, f a vampire? No, 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 but, you know... I don't think she's all the way alive, if you know what I mean. Amity looks, like, really creeped out. I, I, I'll, I'll keep my eye on her. I'll, I'll tell you if I, if I see anything weird. Right. Thanks, no, thanks he pats her on. Oh, of course, love. He pats her on the shoulder and turns back to uh, Earth and Deer and Lillison. Oh, is everything all right over there? Yeah. Just checking. Appreciate it. Very conscientious of you. I try. Um, Metron, you said there was something really important. You 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 came here in an awful hurry. Oh yes. As well. you say this, uh, Kiva, uh, as you make your way down from the tent, um, passing by the cart and leaving the Marta cubs behind you, 
you uh, see coming up the trail uh, in the opposite direction from you a pair of uh, women uh, with uh, olive skin, uh, dark uh, kind of luscious curls of hair going down their back, wearing bright, colorful uh, clothing, um, clearly Bastani by their dress, uh, kind of making their way up the hill uh, toward the tent with very kind of sullen, glum expressions on their faces, uh, scimitars sheathed at their sides. They don't even offer you a glance as they make their way up the trail past you. Uh, and as you pass down the halfway point of the hill, you can see uh, Metreon and the others gathered uh, away from the hill toward the uh, eastern side, kind of clustered amongst themselves toward the tree line. So I hate to be this person, but when you say that, of course she's going to want to talk to them um, now that she is on the way to <laughs> also trying to look for Arabelle. So can she try to briefly stop them? Uh, sure, you can do that. Uh, you kind of pause and, uh, by this point you've passed them, but if you'd like, you can try to get their attention. Yeah, yeah, she would turn around and just say, um, excuse me, ladies. Uh, yes, sir. What is it? Uh, might I to assume that you're, um, looking for young Arabel? One of them frowns. The other one kind of glances askantly and says cautiously, that would be correct. Look, I, j I just spoke to Lavash and, um, He's asked me to assist, uh, and my group, we're, we're not from here, obviously, but, um, look, I, I just want to help any way I can, and, uh, I just wanted to know if you'd found anything. Not as such, no. We, uh, checked down by the Luna River, down by the old ruins. Um, not a sight of her, but we hopefully she's not gone much further than, uh, the fucking River. Okay, no sign of um, down south. Is there any places you haven't started to look yet? Maybe we can start going out that way, or um, or you could point us in a in a direction that you want us to go check out. Ex exchange glances. Uh, I am not sure. Uh, I know that there were uh, perhaps two dozen folk uh, out and looking about the woods and uh, uh, the riverside. Um, I don't know. I'm sorry. Um, we uh, kind of split off in all our different ways. Okay, uh, just figured it was worth a shot. Uh, thank you very much. Of course. And she kind okay. of nods toward you and makes her way back up the hill. Uh, okay, so yeah, then Kiva would go back to the group. All right, the rest of you see Kiva approaching at this point. Yeah, she is the lady of the hour. So? Well, uh... I don't know how much Metreon has filled you all in on, but um, one of the, uh, I guess, I don't know if he's a, a leader here or not, seems to be in charge of something. Uh, his name is Luvash. His daughter, uh, Arabelle, is missing. She's seven years old. Uh, was missing uh, as of yesterday morning. Uh, last seen with um, a young man who has decidedly been punished for his uh, misplacing of her. Um, aren't really any leads, but, um, if we bring her back to him, uh, it gives us, uh, a bargaining chip for safe passage out. Erthund, your perks up a little. All right. What's our search area? Anywhere <laughs> in the woods <laughs> and all of the structures nearby. <laughs> they truly have no idea where she could have gone. Uh, uh. I know that she would have, uh, according to Lavash, she would have avoided a certain haunted mansion. Um, she likely wouldn't have gone back to the city because obviously the Vistani aren't very friendly there. Um, so she the could potentially be in the, the woods. Country. Pretty much, yeah. Well, maybe we can uh, ask somebody's uh, elves here. Maybe they saw something, or maybe they know something. You know? I don't think you're going to be that lucky. I don't think they leave. Well, they have yeah, eyes. According to Lavash, they're just a bunch of sad sacks who sit around all day, so I don't know what the deal is with that, but uh, I don't think they're going to be much help. You could I'm... certainly say that. I'm still caught up on to the, the words you said, way out. Yeah, well, so 
uh, if we find her, and hopefully we find her alive, uh, they're going to help us get out of here. They see they they they're starting. They can uh, they can come and go as they please or something, you know. Uh, and they also have uh, these potions. See, they uh they apparently Kiva help. gives Matriana a look. Oh. Very expensive, dubious potions that supposedly give us immunity to the mist. <laughs> Amity thumps her tail on the ground. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. We're absolutely doing it. If we can't do it, Matron, maybe you can come in and steal some potions. But we're doing it. Okay. Yeah, so one hundred percent doing it. Yeah, but just, like, just want to be clear here. Uh, this girl is very likely dead. Oh, of course. How long has she been away? A day now, and she's seven. And in, in this wilderness. Exactly. So probably we're going to be bringing back a body for them to dispose of in whatever way is custom for them. So well, well, maybe you... stealing from them right after isn't the best idea. Well, it's just so just so we're clear, though. It, it's just a matter of bringing her back, dead or alive. It's not, the, you know, the terms and conditions ain't she has to come back. I don't think they're going to be as friendly if we bring her back dead. Well, but that's going to be difficult because she almost certainly is. But, yeah, I understand. Well, and I, not, I, tri- I, tried, I tried to talk to Lavash about that and explain that I have a uh, life experience in this particular field. Um, he seemed to be amenable to helping us regardless, but... We have to treat her, no matter what condition we find her in, with the utmost respect. I have to do this carefully. This is a one chance, one shot deal. Thank you. Sure, uh, but if, if we, you know, if it doesn't go perfectly, then Metreon, you you surveyed the camp. Do you think you'll be able to get some potions? Do you know where they're keeping them? I don't, but you know, I have my ways. You know. Uh, yeah, that we could we could work something. Bit of invisibility, bit of sneak. We could figure some out. Leave what gold we kill will if that'd make you feel better. I don't feel comfortable using their potions at all, but uh, I don't feel comfortable dying. Look, we can talk about that when we get to that point. Um, no, that's that's fair. That was un- that was unkind. And if you, you know, you really think they're sugar water. Look, I was. I lived with a person like yeah. this guy for years. He's a swindler. He's just trying to sell you stuff. A hundred gold for one of these magic potions that somehow Strahd is okay with leaving? I mean, come on. It, it seems like a farce. Yeah, that that's a very good point. Especially if he knows where we are at all times and Kiva, has eaten... I told you I need something to believe in, so please just fucking humor me right now. Do the rest of us know that Kiva can sense magic? Oh, we saw her do it at the Burgomaster's house. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody will suggest, wait, Kiva, you, you have some thing going on where you can, like, sense magic, right? So you can just tell. Sure, at, at some point if we're handed the potions, but, I mean, I think the focus right now is we need to find the girl, and unfortunately the Marchikovs are not going to be helping us. We're on our own for this. Well, listen, right. the girl's the bargain girl. here. So, exactly. You know. And then you can go around, and you know, if things don't work out perfectly, you could maybe figure out where they have the potions because you can sense where the magic is. Exactly. All right. All this is kind of getting us away from one central question: Where do we start? Like, we unless one of y'all has like a bloodhound, I don't see something more cordial than literally just combing the woods. I spoke to two Vistani women who looked like they were coming back from a search themselves. It seems like 12 or so people have just gone into the woods. Okay, so the woods are probably handy. In every direction. And there really isn't a plan to try to find her, so... Yeah, no. Sure, but I don't know the area enough to find any other landmarks around here. And she doesn't go far from the camp. There's no places that she would go for safety or security. There's no places that even have a fond memory for her. Well, and... Erethrindir. Yeah. You still have that map you drew, yes? Uh, <laughs> yep, yeah, I've got it. Do you think that we could get some of the people here to fill it in a bit more and then tell us what a one-day radius looks like? He snorts. I think they'd laugh at my drawing skills first, but yeah, maybe. Well, speaking of snorting, uh, 
and uh, Matron looks down at uh, Truffle. Maybe if we get, uh, you know, uh, maybe an article of clothing, you know, some uh, hair, something something that was hers, you know, stuffed animal. Maybe, uh, well, I don't know, Truffle could sniff it out. Help us there, you know? Right, maybe the like advantage... The, uh, the, the one thing we, we have that they don't is that people don't really like the Vassan here, right, for obvious reasons. And so maybe we can go talk to people and get information that they wouldn't. I don't think we should go back into Falaki. Yeah. Given right. all the trouble we just took to get out. Okay, so let's think logically. Erythrindir, like, finds a nearby stump and spreads the map on it. So, they're searching the woods, right? They're just going around doing their uncoordinated thing because they're worried. We have the advantage that we're relatively fast. We are can probably survive an encounter with... The creatures, the creatures of the woods, as long as we get back to civilization before nightfall. And we might think to go place, we might think in patterns that they won't. So, you're a little girl. You're lost, and you don't see anything familiar. Or you're a little girl, and you're out playing, and you don't realize how far you've gone. Or you're a little girl, and, you know, something takes you. Maybe like a wolf or something, you know? Yeah. So in those circumstances, and if the forest is a no-go, where do we look? Well, Barovia ain't that big, it seems. I mean, at least from from here to Velaki to uh, Barovia, it seems we could get there, you know, uh, at least within a day. If I were a little girl and I would lost, and I would lost, I would try to go to a big landmark, uh, like west to this river, river we crossed earlier, or north to the big lake, or the road. Landmark's a point. There's, we've we had like the crossroads with the nooses. That doesn't seem very child friendly. We got a bridge. Where else? Look, I'm I'm telling you, there, there really is no information. Oh and... no, I'm not. I'm not blaming you. I'm just. Bem- no, 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 no. I, I don't think trying to think like a little girl will help either. I think we just need to go as quick as we can through as much area as we can and hope that she's somewhere along the way. Exactly. If she's still alive, then we have to find her and bring her back before she comes back of her own volition. That's a way to put it. I I mean, I don't know that that's true. We should find her soon, in either case. I can I can try to send messages um at least that will cover a larger area. If she's alive, she can respond. Um, right. If she's unconscious, then, well, that's a separate problem anyway, so. Yeah, all right. Well, in that case, we need to pick a path, something that do- that make- means we can get back here before nightfall. Well, I said that she wouldn't have gone west, so east and north are probably the best directions to go in, because, you know, pretty far south, ain't we? Yeah, so, and she wouldn't have gone towards Velaki, from what Kiva said, so we got a pretty narrow slice. I guess we could just go straight up and down. I, I don't know, maybe she had our, our idea, wanted to go swimming in the river or something. That seems like a good place to start, and I feel like using water as a guide, at least, I don't know, if I were running, which I yeah. was for a while, I stayed close to water. That was a pretty good guide. Yeah. Honey, everything. did you get any sense that she might have been running away? No, I, I mean, from all I've got, it seems like her father loves her very much. He's a big brute of a man, but he got very emotional when he spoke of her. Um, and I, well. I could tell that he was fucking with me about the potions, but I think his concern for his daughter was very genuine. All right. They already have someone going down the road. There, there were more Vistani somewhere else, right? Like Apparently get... all throughout the woods. So I think Deer's plan is probably the safest. Yeah, all right. And that way we minimize our own risk. We could still get murdered on these roads. Take a straight shot north, take a straight shot south, see what we find. All right, well, no time like the present, so let's, let's, uh, let's crack on then. Yeah, let's, let's get going. Right. That'd be nice. 
All right. And so you make your way away from the Vistani encampment and back toward the wilderness trails uh, leading toward uh, the main Spellage Road. Where are you headed? North. Any particular direction? Oh, well, just north. north, I think. Yeah. North. North in such a way that we can reliably replicate our trail so we can find the road again and don't fucking die. All like, right. Erith and Dewey's doing the whole, like, mark swatches on the path as we go to make sure that we don't just wander off forever. That's ranger training. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, you make your way north, following the uh, brief pattern of hunting trails through the small slice of the Svalich wood that cordons off the encampment from the main path, and before long, find your way once more onto the old Svalich road, just out of sight of Balaki. You can see to the east of you, just faintly through the mist, the old hunkered down abandoned hovels left to rot in the fog outside of Velaki's walls, and to the west of you, uh, you can see perhaps a half a mile away, just faintly through the mist, the faint edges of the bridge that you've previously seen cross the Luna River. So, uh, we crossed the river. Do we want, uh, in character? Uh, so, here's a river. Do we want to follow it up? Uh, Seems reasonable. Seems like yeah. the best place to go. Or, yeah, DM, if I see any, like, forest animals around, like, you know, a bird or a squirrel or something, then tell me, because I might want to cast, like, a speak with animals, because maybe they'd have seen... Uh, that is a good idea. Yeah. Make a perception Actually, check. I'll start casting, I'll start ritual casting speak with animals right now. It's a ritual spell, right? So yeah, I'll start ritual casting it right now. Um, okay. And while that's happening, uh, here's your perception check. 14. 14. 14, okay. Uh, well, Amity is uh, ritual casting speak with animals. Uh, what are you all doing? Lillison is going to uh, periodically try to send uh, messages out to, I assume she would have gotten the name, uh, to Arabelle. Oh, yeah, Kiva would have mentioned her name. So what are you trying to do? Trying send to messages? Uh, send message, yes. Okay, what is the exact text of message? Uh, you point your finger towards a creature within range and whisper a message, so... Okay, um, I would say that if you're not pointing to a creature within range, then, you know, unless you can see her, it's not going to work. Okay, yeah. Hi. Or at least unless you know where she is. I mean, you can't that, like car key thing where you just spin. <laughs> keep pressing the button. Unfortunate. Unfortunately, uh, Lillison is not a radio tower. Sadly. <laughs> not yet. Yet. Not yet, exactly. <laughs> Multi class. Yeah, if uh, if I were familiar with her and knew where she she was, then I could uh, ping her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who's gonna do the cliche thing and look for footprints? Okay. Uh, yeah, Kiva make... also will look as well. All right. All right. Each of you may make a survival check, and um, or one of you can make it with advantage. Up to uh, you. Want to make it with advantage, or shall I? Yeah, I'm proficient in survival, so. Same. Go for it. Oof. Maybe that didn't help at all. I said twelve max. Um. All right. At the twelve, you do your best to search around for footprints, and you do find. Um, a few different sets of footprints making their way along the path. Uh, and then you're reminded of what the Vistani and Casimir mentioned about uh, sending several of their folk uh, mm -hmm. out of the settlement. And you think, oh, that's probably the belonging to them. Plus, she'd be child-sized. Yeah, you don't find any child-sized footprints. Damn it. I think we keep moving then. Best we just comb through these woods, see what we can find. Yeah. Hope they find something. And if, if she drowned, we're not finding her. Thank you for the reminder. Metreon, we are on a mission to rescue a child who is probably dead. Don't, don't give me that. Just be, we can be honest. He just rolls his eyes, um, but he is kind of on the lookout uh, as he's rolling his eyes at Randy to see if he sees any other kind of 
uh, marks in the woods. He's not the most proficient in, you know, survival or nature. He's not a, he's a city boy, but if there's maybe anything like, um, like drag marks or something like that, that might indicate that she was, you know, uh, taken or maybe like paw prints from wolves or something like that to see if there's anything in the, uh, anything that like might indicate something like that. Okay. You can make a survival check if you'd like. 13. There's no sign of anything out of the ordinary. Um, I would say at this point, Amity, you complete your um, ritual. Um, what do you roll for perception? 14. Um, with that, looking around, you don't uh, notice any immediate uh, animals nearby. Okay. Well, um... Seems the road's we'll, pretty quiet. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, maybe you can talk to some of the wolves when they ambush get us again. You know, to say, excuse me, excuse me, before we get to the whole eating you thing, you might, you seen a little girl about yay big. <laughs> I don't know if you're joking or not, but that's not actually a bad idea. I was, but now that I think of it... Huh. I'm I'm a, I'm a refrain from making loud wolf attracting noises, regardless. Yeah, please do that. It, 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 uh, I, I prefer not to have to run from wolves uh, while we're doing this. Yeah, that it was a rather bad time the first time. God. Oh boy, I hate this music change. Me too. I guess we keep moving. If everyone's all right with it. Yeah. Okay, I are mean, you heading I, northward I, through the woods? Are you following the road toward the bridge? Where are you headed? I, I think we're following the river, right? Yeah. So okay. I think, we, yeah, we're just kind of keeping on that path and just trying to keep our eyes out. Mm -hmm. So maybe, I don't know, Amity, if maybe you could talk to Fish. <laughs> oh my god. They probably don't know the shit that's happening up here. But you could. <laughs> Sorry, what did Metreon suggest that Amity could do? I missed that word. Talk to fish. Oh, huh. <laughs> I don't know how that would work. Stick your head in the water and see what happens. I guess so. Well, we'll see. <laughs> All right. Well, as you make your way westward, you approach the uh, old bridge um, across which you can see the uh, Lunar River crossroads through the faint mist. You can see the Lunar River stretching uh running, uh, I believe, north to south. Um, as it passes beneath the bridge, the trickling of the water uh, as it rushes across its banks, uh, quiet. Um, there is a slight river bank on either side uh, of the encroaching tree line. Any sign of Arabelle-related people? Um, you can... If, if you're, I presume you're I kind ask. of going routinely. So if you, yeah, if you're yeah. like going as you go, I can just use your passive perception. So I'd rather not. Uh, that is them's the rules. So what is your passive perception? I believe the highest are Kiva and Dolson with thirteen, right? I have a ten. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's yeah. Kiva and Dolson do not notice any clues as they scan the tree line on their path toward the cross toward the bridge. Uh, Kiva, what's your passive? Mine is fourteen. Wait, let me look. What is it? What is it? Plus? Uh, it's eight plus your perception. A ten plus your perception oh, shit. modifier. Never mind. Ten Thank plus you. perception modifier is fourteen. Yeah, I have fourteen as well. All right. Um, you don't see uh, any indication of anything out of the ordinary. Is it in character okay, um... or anything? Hmm? It, from the music, is it in character raining? There's like a light drizzle, kind of ever present, but Excellent. it's not severe. Good mood. Yeah, uh, Mitran raises his hood as to keep his makeup from running. Well, I guess further north, unless we want to try and catch a fish. No, I think that's the best plan, is we just want to try to keep moving. <sighs> On. After y'all. OK. 
Okay. Together you pass north alongside the riverbank, leaving the bridge across the Luna River behind as you venture further parallel to the tree line. As you do, uh, Lillison, you notice something out of the corner of your eye, what seems to be a, a bit of fabric, kind of uh, brown clothes, uh, just the edge of perhaps a shirt or something, you're not sure. It seems to be sticking out of the edge of a uh, large fallen log. Lillison will stop, um, summon her mage hand, and then uh, have the mage hand very carefully try to uh, pull it free. All right. Um, you kind of pull it three. Um, the rest of you see Lillison kind of stop for a moment as you see the ethereal skeletal hand kind of make its way into the uh, rotted out log through. You can see it's almost got a hollow center and begin tugging something free. Uh, let me check something real quick. Metron, as uh, Lillison is doing this, is kind of this mix of excited but also apprehensive, uh, thinking the worst of uh, the thing that could be being drug out of that log. Staring around at the trees and nature, Amity is going to expend uh, bardic inspiration to roll in the spirit table. Okay. Ooh. Um, Lillison, as you kind of pull whatever it was free, you see kind of pulled out of the hollow log where it had been stuffed, what seems to be a small bundle of some kind um, wrapped in what seems to be um, a, uh, a hide of leather that has been kind of pulled around whatever it contains and tied in place with a bit of uh, string. She's going to frown and then step closer and try to have her mage hand undo the string. Okay. It comes open easy enough and the bundle falls open, revealing uh, that the bundle appears to contain one set of common clothes. You see a uh, drab brown tunic and a pair of kind of gray undyed uh, uh, pants alongside them. Are these child-sized or adult-sized? They are adult-sized. Wilson sighs in disappointment and uh, then has her mage hand start folding everything back up again, um, trying to get it back to the way that it had been. All right, the rest of you can see Lillison doing this. What is that? A set of clothing. It doesn't seem to be related. Just stuck in a log just stuck in a log is this not a thing that rangers and other people who live in the woods do it is generally something we only find if there's a fugitive about so <laughs> oh um I mean these look clean and um hmm. alright yeah that are would qualify prints? that are there footprints uh, make a survival check if you'd like to check the area. That is a nine. None that you can see. <sighs> Freaking rain. Okay, that's bizarre. Like, nobody goes out in the woods, right? Like, normal people here just stay in their towns. I so mean, they're where the guides that we hired and... Normal people stay in the woods, stay at home, mm, right? Yes. I mean, would, do any of you want another set of spare clothing? No, no, I don't want to know what that clothing's been through before it got to us. Oh, all right. And she continues uh, trying to get everything folded back up and uh, tied up with the string. Well, easy enough to do. You're able to stow it back in the hollow log, leaving it where you found it. Onward and upward. And then he sighs deeply. I... This is stupid. This whole thing's ridiculous. We're not going to find her. It's a... Even... There, there's what? Like... Who knows how many square miles to search? 
they're the odds of us even stumbling across and the clues infinitesimal. Look, we're gonna try, and that's it. And if we can't find her before nightfall, then we just move on. That's all we can do. Sure. With that, you leave the bundle behind in the hollow log where you found it and continue north on your way, following the river as it as the bridge behind you passes out of sight into the mists. Lillison and Kiva keeping a sharp eye out for anything that might uh, come upon their path. As you do, you come to a place where the mouth of the river connects with the edge of a large misty lake. Looking it out across it, you can see here that at the foot of the mountain, nestled in the misty forest around you, is this enormous body of water. The water itself is perfectly still and dark, reflecting the black clouds overhead like a monstrous mirror. You can see that the riverbank to your right continues bending to the east around the edge of the lake, while on the opposite side of the river it continues bending north and west. Oh my god. Erythrindir just kind of steps forward, pushing the sodden hair into something so we can actually see. Uh, it's beautiful. Bismarck chuckles. Maybe we will see the uh, Mad Mage of Mad Bertok. I've heard some stories. That'd be fun. The who? The Mad Mage of Mad Bertok. Uh, I heard about them when I was asking around in Wallachy. Seems there is some crazy wizard skulks around the, the north shore of Lake Zerwich. Folks used to see him uh, shooting bolts of lightning uh, into the water. Killed lots of fish. I mean, it's effective, I suppose. That, huh, maybe someone to keep in mind, but... He just puts his head in his hands. This is as far north as we go, right? We take a circuit around the lake, not around the mage side, and then we acknowledge that we haven't found her. We can at yeah. least, um, when we're going back southwards, uh, travel through a different swath of the woods. That's dangerous. We There's no sun here. I don't have a compass. We've, we can follow the river, but if we get away from that, there's a very real chance we're going to start going not south. Other side of the river, then? That's, that's a good idea. <sighs> Would have been a terrible day for swimming anyway. It's drizzly. Does that matter when you're already going to be fully immersed? It makes it feel worse, if you can believe it. <laughs> it's like going from being a little wet to a lot wet. It's just... Ugh. Ugh. Kiva coughs <clears throat> a little bit and then says, Phrasing. And, uh, we're gonna move on. Oh. 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 Yeah, sure. Let's, let's keep... Let's go around the lake. All right, are you taking the, uh... Are you crossing the river toward the west bank, or are you staying on this side, on the east bank? Uh, which side? Did, did Ismark say or, it was this lake, or...? So, or... yes, he said, uh, I would think that this is Lake Zerwich. Okay, and the Mad Mage was on the west bank. On the north side. Okay, then it doesn't from? matter which way we go, as long as we don't go all the way around. Uh, Izzy, what makes him mad? Uh, I would imagine that anyone who... Uh, tries to fish with bolts of lightning is uh, a bit touched in the head. Oh, it's just very efficient. That is true, but from what I've heard, he does not collect the fish. Very wasteful. Oh. Yeah, no, that's a crying shame. Well, good thing you didn't go swimming then, because you might have got, you know... Electricity well, doesn't reach that far. I'd be fine. Well, I don't know these things. I don't know fuck about... It's water to me. Well, now you do. Oh, thank you. And if it, you can, if you ever want to go, if you want to go swimming after we finish this, then you can do so knowing you'll be safe from anything but a very tiny zap. 
you know, I'll stay on the beach, you know, and he kind of gestures to his face and his makeup. Ah, oh, come on. You'd have fun. Little girl first, swimming later. Yeah, no, I know. I'm just talking. Let's let's go. Let's do this. Let's start on the let's start going east, I suppose, and then when we come back around, we can cross the river, look a little bit on the western side, and then follow the other side of the river back. Yep, good plan. Thanks, Lawson. She gives him like the shadow of a smile. Yeah, no, he's not he's not exactly looking too chipper either. Yeah, I guess we Mm. Come on. Okay. You continue making your way around the north side of the tree line as it bends with the shores of Lake Zarevich. You leave the Lunar River behind. Uh, you see small bits of mist forming and dissipating across the surface of the chill lake. Behind you, just the dark shadows of the trees that stretch up be behind you into the distance. As you continue making your way, uh, Eastward by now, perhaps um, I believe it's perhaps been around forty-five minutes since you departed the Vistani camp. Um, you can see uh, growing into view um, toward the east. You can see a place where the tree line begins to recede, um, and just faintly, you can see the beginnings of a beach beginning to come into sight. As you do, you can see. Pulled up along the south shore are three small rowboats. A fourth boat can be seen in the middle of the lake with a lone figure sitting in it, fishing pole in hand. To the south, you can see the road continuing south between the trees, uh, and just faintly in the mist, you can see the northern wall of what you presume to be Velaki. I guess it's a good day to go fishing enough, isn't it? Yeah, rain always makes them jump. Wait, um, wait, there's somebody out there. Yeah, you didn't see him in the boat. No, no, I mean, like, we could talk to him. Oh, yeah, Emmy runs up to the to the shore, um, getting her feet a little bit wet, and waves her arms, yelling out, Hey, hey, you out there? And there's no response. The person in the boat doesn't uh, turn to regard you. How cold is the water? It's pretty cold, you know. Um, the air temperature is not particularly warm, and the water is not very comfortable for swimming. It might be too far out to hear us, but do you think we can just take one of these boats? If they've got paddles in them, sure. It might be a message him. Got that, uh, and Metron makes the finger, like, finger gun motion. Uh, you could shoot one of them uh, bolts, right? Maybe uh, shoot up a flare. Yeah, but people already think we're terrifying. I don't want our first exposure to this man to be wild magic. I know. How far away is this person? Um, he's maybe, uh, I mean, I have no appreciation of distance. Uh, so let's say he's maybe <laughs> an eighth or a quarter of a mile out on the water. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, he can't hear uh, us. Please don't, don't take that for granted. Like, Maybe a few hundred yards. Again, I have no appreciation of distance. I am incapable of distance. Assume that the okay. distance in the picture is an accurate reflection. Okay, but more than 120 feet, which is the range of message. Yes, he is out of range of message. Okay. We're talking like city blocks. Okay. Uh, do the rowboats look to have paddles in them? They do, yes. They do have oars. Amity's going to hop in a rowboat and take some paddles. Yeah, yeah, good idea. Here, let me, and he'll pop in with her. Here, I'll, you, you know, you know the procedure for this. Um, yeah, but I don't know if all seven, eight of us, wait, so there's us, there's Truffle, there's Irina, there's Ismark, there's like a lot of people. I don't know if we're all going to fit in. Don't worry. Kiva will stay on the beach. She was, she's fine to stay on the beach. She's not really a fan of water, so she's, she will stay away. How many we only people? really talk to him. How many people do each of these boats seat? It seems that you could probably fit uh, five people per boat. 
Lilith you could try will... to load more in, but the safety of doing so is debatable. <laughs> Lilithson will get in the boat with uh, Amity and Erthrendir. Those of you still on shore, maybe you can look for footprints. The sandy loam around the lake. Uh, it's probably going to be easier to find them. We'll do that, love. Uh, we'll, we'll get right on it. Sandy loam? You a naturalist or something? Naturalist? I just read it in a book once. Yeah. I don't actually know any, like, you know, other specific things. No, it's still cool. It's a good word, loam. Yeah, loam. Mitra looks to Kiva. What the fuck is a loam? Look, I've stopped trying to know what they're talking about a long time ago. It's a type of dirt. Uh -oh. Get in that water then, yeah? If you insist. All right. Do you want to... Amity, you want the left side or the right? Um, that's not exactly... Wait, so... Sorry, is there enough space for the boat for that question to make sense? Because I'm used to boats having, like, a front and a back when they're this small. Uh, I, I meant, like, paddle. Oh, right, okay. Um, I, all right, I'll take the left paddle. I, I'll go right, and, uh, Lillison, you might need to go right, too. I don't think I can match Amity's gun, or arms. Uh, all right. Yes, yes, that is the plan. She just rolls okay. her eyes when the pun hits her. So, uh, Lilith and Amity and Erthendir are going out in the boat, and uh, Metreon and Kivar are staying on shore, is that it? Yep. yep. Uh, yeah, and with, uh, I guess, Ismark and Irina, who are apparently with us this entire time. Yep. They're, they're very quiet. They got a lot to process. Jim, is there anything strange about Lilith's paddling stance? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Other than the fact that she's ne <laughs> she doesn't know how to paddle. She's a little stiff, Amity. Perhaps too stiff. <laughs> she she tries right. her best. So, uh, Kiva and Metron, if you'd like if to inspect the shore for footprints, you can make a survival check. Meanwhile, you see your... Uh, three compatriots uh, making their way out onto the lake, the uh, rowboat beginning to slink forward into the mist. That's Holy an 11 for me. low rolls. That's a six. Beautiful. Um, Kiva, you search the shore and you find nothing of note. Netron, you do find uh, footprints, um, a singular set that appear to make their way from uh, the road leading into town on toward the lake. You presume them to be the man's footprints. They seem to be quite recent. Well, makes sense. Uh, as we're on the beach, though, uh, Metron kind of whispers over to Kiva. Oi, so um, I'll let Amity know about uh, Lil. Should we have let them go off together then? I mean, Amity can take care of herself, and I mean, uh, Randy's pretty keen on Lilson, and I, I think they'll be fine right now. All right, um... Look, I'm sorry if I was being a little uh, depressing earlier. I, I know how important hope is, and I just, you know, I'm I'm on your side, is all I want to say. Thank you, love. I am sorry for yelling at you back there, you know. I'm, it's been a hell of a hell of a week. No, I know. Um, should we maybe try to split up with his Mark and Irina, or, or split up all four of us and look oh, at the directions? Oh, sorry, I forgot they were back there. Oh, I... Uh, we'll, we'll uh, guess. Uh, uh, maybe maybe we'll we can cover more ground individually or, or as a group. I don't. I don't know. Well, I don't really feel too keen on, uh, you know, getting too far away from Arena. Uh, yeah. Uh, totally. Um. So yeah, maybe we should just stay together then. And yeah, we'll just kind of stay together as a as a foursome, kind of okay. uh, walking the beach. Doing so is easy enough as you glance around along the beach and the few tr trees that border the shoreline as you watch the boat slowly making its way out to meet its fellow in the center. Uh, Earth, Thurndir, and Lillison, uh, as you pull your way through the lake, you are hit by some of the uh, chill spray water of the lake. It's cold. 
not freezing, but unpleasant to be sprayed with, and some of the water is just like moisture and mixes with the wetness of the air as the mist swirls around the paddles. As you approach, you can see the figure coming more clearly into view. A man with a slightly scraggly, unkempt beard, more of a overgrown five o'clock shadow, wearing a uh, small fisher's hat that covers over the eyes of his face. Um, you can see he appears to be just as, uh, next to a fishing pole that's leaning halfway over the edge. He's not quite holding it. And without really noticing you as approach, you watch as he slowly, almost robotically, turns down into the lower half of the boat and begins to fiddle with something. You're close enough to try to talk to him as, again if you'd like, but he doesn't seem to responding to you. Yeah, I think the, sort of the whole time we've been going, I've uh, Enby's intermittently been sort of waving a hand to try to catch his attention and being like, "Hey, excuse me, you out there?" The man doesn't respond. He kind of bows down lower in the boat. You see him like fidgeting for a second, as if he's moving something or uh, adjusting something. You think he's deaf? Or hard of hearing, maybe. If we have gotten within 120 feet of him, a uh, little symbol cast message. Okay. What do you do with, or what do you say? Um, just going to say, excuse me, can you hear us? There's no response. Um, as you see him, he pulls his head up, um, staring straight forward. His eyes... Now, you're not close enough. You can see he's just... His gaze has not flickered, almost as though he's in a trance. But this time, you see that he's holding something in his arms. What appears to be a large uh, burlap sack. Um, and he kind of cradles, grunting with the weight, as though... Um, you can see that he appears to be somewhat skinny and underfed, uh, just still staring ahead, his body trembling very faintly. And as he turns, uh, you watch as he holds the burlap sack over the water, and for a moment, you watch it wriggle and writhe in his hands. Close, well, so you just faintly hear a muffled grunt, and then he opens his arms and lets the sack drop into the water. Okay, are we within range that he would be able to hear us if we shouted? Uh, yes. And the grunt that you heard came not from him, but from the sack. Okay. Oh. I use a bonus action to roll on the spirit table. Ooh. Oh, shit. What on earth is this one? Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah, Amity sort of looks at Lilson and, and Erythrindir, like, just to be clear, GM, like, the size of the bag, I don't know how obvious it's supposed to be to our characters that what's happening is happening. Um, it, but, Lilison, with your passive perception, it definitely looks like there's some kind of creature inside of that bag, by the proportions of it, quite probably humanoid. Lilson has an action queued up, but I want to uh, get Amity's uh, thing resolved first. Oh yeah, Amity's just sort of looking back at her companions, like, "Do you think? Do you think that could be?" I don't want to find out. Okay, Lilson is going to shout to the man, "Get that sack back and give it to the strangers in the rowboat." And she is casting Subtle Suggestion. Ooh. Oh my god. Okay. What's your spell save, DC? It is... 14. 14? Um... He just takes the fishing pole in his hand and watches the sack sink, completely ignoring you. 
Um, it is sinking fast. You don't have much time if you want to do anything. Erythrindir is tearing his like, Go! You got it! I'm too... I believe in you! Just go! And he's going to give her bardic inspiration. Yeah, Amity's, Amity's going in. Diving. Uh, can she get to the bag? All right. Uh, uh, is Amity the only one diving in? Oh, Erythrindir's going once he realizes the armor isn't coming off quickly. Yeah, no, he's going. All right, uh, Kiva and Metron, the two of you can uh, also see what's going on. Uh, Kiva, with your passive perception, you see the man in the boat take out what looks to be a wriggling sack. And then a beat later, you see uh, Amity and Erythrindir dive into the water. Kiva's running into the water. She's wait, 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 what was going on? She figures out what's going on and she's jumping in full armor and everything. Metron right. rushes to the edge of the water and lets her jump in, but he'll kind of look back at Irina and Ismark and stay, stay put. Ismark nods. Um, all right. Um, I will need... Actually, you know what? Ismark glances at... Let me double check something real quick. Okay. Um, I would say that since Ismark is proficient in perception, he's watched this go on. He glances at Eumetrion at Irina for a split second, looking like a deer in headlights. Um, and as he does, you hear Irina curse loudly. Damn it, Ismark. You're doing useless. And she pushes him aside and she dives in the water. Oh he my god! Of course she does. Uh, and a moment later, Ismark is after her. He's in, dives in the water. He's going to sink like a stone. If they're good swimmers, they'll be to us in maybe like a matter of several minutes. <laughs> All right, I will is. need, uh, first off, the two of you in the boat, Amity and Erythrindir, to make athletics checks. Oh, okay, no. do you want to drum roll these checks? Uh... Yeah, yeah, this feels like a drum roll moment. Count, count of three, count of three. Linus. Oh uh, yeah, sure. Okay, three, two, two one. one. Oh my god. Click. Oh. So I get oh! to add a bardic inspiration to this. Come on, okay. come on. Please, it's a D eight. Remember, it's a D eight. Bardic inspiration back. Oh, Fuck. Dude. Okay. Um. So, what is Erythrindir's final result, and what is Amity's? My final result is a 14. 15 here. Yeah. Okay. With that, uh, Amity Erythrinder, you dive from the boat, uh, doing your best to push through the ice cold water. It cuts against your face, and uh, Erythrinder, you stutter, you stumble for a moment and accidentally inhale some. It cuts into your uh, mouth, into your lungs, and you cough and sputter for a moment. But toward you, you can feel reaching out now, just the edges of the burlap sack slowly sinking now um, a dozen feet below the surface. And at the same moment, you and Amity grasp out and seize hold of it and begin pulling it back to the surface. You can feel it writhing, wriggling in your hands, but the two of you together pull it up, your strength joining with one another, and you breach the surface. <laughs> I'll unwrap, unwrap, unwrap. I'm, un I'm unwrapping, I mean. Yep. And Erythrindir's pointing his, his wand at the man of the boat. Jump well, out right now or I will kill you. Wilson's doing her best to awkwardly row the boat closer to where Amity and Erythrindir are, and she's going to try to, you know, reach out to take the sack. All right. Do you give it to her? Uh, if she gets there before the man vacates the boat, then yes. Are you f doing anything to force the man to vacate the boat? He is pointing his wand at him. He is not responding to you. He's oh, just staring that. at the lake. If, if he, fuck that. Erythrindir raises his wand, his hair sodden, his other hand still clinging and trying to keep the sack above the surface. And he is going to cast Fear. Ooh. Okay, what does that do? Uh, I need him to make me a wisdom save, please. DC 14, or he has to use his reaction to move as far from me as possible and keep moving. As you cast Fear, Amity, are you handing the uh, sack to Lillison, I presume? I mean, we're both unwrapping it, right? Gotcha, uh, okay. I, I guess so, Amity's in the water, so yeah, hand it gotcha. to Lillison. So, Amity heaving the sack up, you see uh, Kiva 
and uh, Ismark and Irina kind of like making their way quickly through the water towards you. Um, Anthony, you point your wand toward the man on the boat and you snarl um, an arcane word. As you do, uh, Lillison, you see the shrieking faces of devils and demons and ghoulish spirits whirl from the tip of the wand in a massive cone, cackling and shrieking as terrible visions swirl through the, the maelstrom of magic that he's conjured. The man of the boat is caught in the middle of it. His eyes go wide, his face pales. He screams and then just leans backward and falls out of the boat. Catherine, dear. Get her, get her on there right now. We're going to need room. Arthur, dear, what did you do? Don't have time right now. We need to get her the water out of her lungs. And he's climbing back into the boat. Yeah, no. Arthur, dear, is going to drag, drag them up. Is there space for us to lay, well, obviously, Arabelle out in our rowboat? Uh, there should be yes, uh, okay. as long as one of you doesn't get back in. In that case, yeah, he'll. In that case, he'll stay. He'll stay in the water and climb into the vacated one. Actually, no. There's only three of you. You can all fit. Okay. Including her, or including what you find. Yeah, he he climbs back in. All right, and as you do, uh, Lillison, you quickly pull open the sack, and as you do, you see within raven black hair the small form of a young girl bound in hempen rope that's now s soggy and sodden with cold water, eyes wide, muffled grunting through the bindings. Appears to be alive and just squirming. She appears to calm a bit at the sight of you. It's all right. It's all right. Your father sent us to find you. Um, Lillison's going to pull out her dagger and start trying to cut away the ropes, but is, you know, still every so often uh, giving just looks at Arthur Hey, he once the once the gags off her mouth, he is going to like see if she swallowed any water or anything like that. You immediately remove the gag and she hacks and coughs. Uh, you can see this young girl with just uh, kind of her eyes flashing as she doubles over and struggles to breathe. <gasps> <sighs> oh my gods, I'm alive, yes? Yes, yes, you're alive. Oh, that was unexpected. I, I did not... <laughs> I thought I saw something like a dream, but I didn't know that it would happen. Earthrender just kind of, like, throws the remains of the sack overboard. Is there... Are you alright? Anything broken? Anything like that? I don't think so. Could, could you remove these ropes, uh, please? Shit, I, I fuck. I, I left my knife with Irina. Can either of y'all? Lillison's still cutting through the ropes. <laughs> By this point, uh, Kiva uh, and Irina have arrived. Is marked slightly slower due to his armor. Um, Lillison, you are able to slice through the ropes pretty easily, and the young girl breathes out. You can see that she's wearing a uh, colorful clothing, uh, though now sodden with uh, lake water. She rubs her. Uh, wrists and forearms, kind of adjusting herself in the boat, looking quite relieved. Kiva, upon seeing this girl alive, just starts absolutely crying and, like, goes to hug Irina and also is still swimming. It's a very emotional moment for her, but seeing this girl alive is just like, oh my god, you've probably never seen Kiva this fucking happy, and she's also sobbing. <laughs> Irina kind of blinks and looks over. What what happened? You Oh my By the morning light you found her. You You saved yeah. her. Yeah. Earth and Deer's kinda just shaking. And then he just looks at Amity. You uh, we we did it. We actually we did it. We 
We saved someone's life. And he's just like, he just, he, he's almost crying, but there's also an exuberant grin on his face. And he just reaches out and kisses her on the cheek. Good and job. And he glomp hugs him. Um. <laughs> yeah, he returns it. Just kind of like shaking. Well, here, for instance. Is, is, is the other dude around? The, the murderer. Ludo is not get does not get to be you in watch this his, moment. The man is just okay. swimming away as quickly <laughs> as he can, um, in the opposite direction. Yes, he has to keep. Just kind of the spell runs out. How long does it last? And does he get additional saving throws? Not until he leaves my line of sight and one minute. Yeah, he's gonna he he's, he's still swimming. He's Wilson still is, swimming. Wilson is gonna just be standing like a, oblivious of all the hugs that are happening. And it's just like staring after Bluto and she's shaking. The man whose name you don't know. Yeah, the, yes, the man. The mystery. But yeah, no, he just kind of pulls away from Amity. God. <laughs> you did amazing. I, I only had the courage to jump in in the first place because of, um, well, I guess both of you. Hey, if if I only took credit for stuff other people help me with, I would have no accomplishments to my name. Our, Still we, we did amazing. I'll take that. As you're saying this, the uh, young girl looks up at you. She's kind of like, you see she's kind of smoothing out her sodden skirts. Very good. Um, please, if you would not mind, um, I'm sure this is a very touching moment, but would you mind returning me to my home, please? The Karen sassiest seven-year-old girl I've ever met. This is every girl I've babysat ever. Yep. He, he just, like, almost falls over laughing. Right. Right. <laughs> of course. Yeah, let's look at Rose or... Fuck. He looks over at the swimming man. And he rolls his wand between his fingers for a moment. And then he sighs and lets it drop and ends the spell. The swimming figure stops and just bobs there in the water for a few moments. I oh, should make sure that he also gets back either to the... Well, I don't know if we can do much in Velaki now, but... Should we, actually? Should we? Arabelle, do you know that man? She frowns. Interesting. So you do know my name. I wasn't sure if that would... Ah, yes. Um... From what I've heard, his name seems to be Bluto, I think. I overheard it from inside the sack when he was uh, taking me. I presume that I, he was in town for a while. I heard what sounded like um, what I am told town sounds like. Um, he is a bit of an unpleasant man. He is... Um, it is unfortunate. I do not know that I blame him. He is uh, quite handicapped, but um, he was not the most pleasant company. Do right, you then. want us to bring him back with us so that your father can do something? She frowns and then faces the man. It is no concern. My father would not want to waste his time punishing one of the soulless. It is inconsequential, yes? Yes. He's the Kiva, one who's to drown you. Yeah, I think he, you get to make the decision. Yeah, Kiva clocks that second instance of, like, talking about people without souls, and she's like, oh, they mean that, like, very quite literally, I suppose. Uh, from the beach, you hear very faintly, is everything all right out there? We got her! <laughs> For once, yes! Hit it! Does Pluto look like he's um, moving, or is he just like just bobbing in the lake? Just bobbing in the lake. He seems to be staying afloat, but just from what you can tell, he seems to be pointed toward you. He's just not coming any closer. I don't like the look of this. I don't know if once we start moving away, whether he will get back in the boat at all, or whether he will just stay there until he falls unconscious and drowns. Kiva um, is like, you know, paddles up a little bit to the listen and, um, and says, 
from what Lavash said, there's nothing there to drown anyway. He's not, uh... Apparently there are people here that don't have um, souls, just shells. They don't feel anything. They don't feel sadness or rage or anything. So, Arabel nods at the sound of this. Do not concern yourselves. The, the Hollow Ones are quite adept at um, survival. I'm sure that uh, it will do what it can to... Uh, Stay alive. But, I mean, I, sorry, I don't know if this is a touchy subject, but there must be some reason that he took you out here, right? We should stop him from doing that to someone else. Do what you like. Do what you like. Um, from his natterings, he seemed to believe that uh, he was making some sort of offering, some sort of sacrifice. He kept uh, mumbling to himself, but... Um, I thought he will try again. Call it the hatch. Earthendeer looks like he does not want to accept this, but just kind of doesn't have the energy to argue with a six-year-old, especially one who could probably spit kick his ass in verbal combat. You're, you're oh, yes, yeah, so you were kind of um, taken aback by this, this child's vocabulary. <laughs> yes. All right. You're awfully calm right now. I'm impressed. Well, I have been rescued and will be soon returned safely to my father. Um, that is uh, not cause for panic, yes? And, and we were told that your father would give us some potions that would allow us to um, go through the mists. That is my father's business. I do not deal in that. <laughs> Stop it! I love this little girl. I love her so much. Well... In that case, let's leave him to his bobbin and get you back to shore, why don't you? That would be appreciated. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Earthen dude just takes up it. Just takes up an oar. Let's. God, I, I, I owe Kiva. I owe you. A, owe you an apology. If we had not been here precisely when we had, then. I don't want to think about it. Look, she's fine, and I'm freezing, so I'm going to go back to shore. I'll see y'all there. That works. And she's just go. going to very quickly start swimming back because she's so fucking cold right now. <laughs> and she hates water. <laughs> uh. Wilson's going to, um, you know, pick up her oars very slowly, but keep looking back to see whether... Um, Bluto, in fact, starts, you know, moving or doing other things once, uh, once the party starts leaving. As you begin rowing your way, uh, back toward the shore, you do see the, uh, drenched figure begin to slowly paddle its way back toward the boat as he does, in fact, seem to be returning to his rowboat. Beth, the rest of you continue making your way through the water. Um, is Mark stepping gratefully back onto the shore and shivering um, uh, with a big smile on his face. Um, the rest of you making your way onto the beach. Arabelle uh, stepped in, stepping uh, gratefully out of the side of the boat onto the um, shore. Though she just kind of stumbled a bit over the side. It is a bit high for her. She is still only seven. But Can Kiva carry her the rest of the way back to the Mastani camp? She uh, notices the attention you're fixing on her. Excuse me, can I help you, miss? Sorry, uh, you... You just remind me of someone. Oh, forgive me. Do you need any help getting back there? I mean, obviously if we'll go with mind, you, uh, I can... Yes, if you would not mind guiding me there and uh, ensuring that... Uh, we do not meet any untoward uh, encounters. I would appreciate that greatly. I am sure that my father will uh, provide you with a great reward for seeing you return safely. Kiva holds out her hand for her and uh, and gestures towards back towards the road once everyone gets back.
Okay. He tra- takes off his jacket, uh, and as he sees, uh, it's Mark and Irina kind of stepping out. Uh, your call, which one are you? Uh, you both look uh, freezing. Who are you addressing? Is Mark and Irina. Gotcha. Um, is Mark chuckles. Don't worry, I'm fine. Um, Irina glances at him for a moment. Uh, I would uh, appreciate anything. Uh, Metron will very carefully drape his oversized leather uh, trench coat over her. Okay. Uh, she accepts it uh, gratefully. And with that, you are you returning by the same route? Yeah. We we made a path. We might as well keep to it. Well, uh, uh, yeah, wait, I bet on. Bad. Arabo. DM. Yes. No. <laughs> um, do you happen to know maybe a quicker way back to the camp from here? I cannot say that I have uh, ventured very far from the camp. Um, I suppose there are. This seems to be a route. Perhaps we could follow it somewhere. Enough. Is she talking about the road back to Velaki? Yes. Um, perhaps we should not go uh, too close to the town walls. She kind of tilts her head and blinks, giving you a quiet, lingering look. Very well. Wherever you wish to go. Just back the way we came, then, I think is best. All right. Um, And she steps in uh, beside you and prepares to follow you as you make your way. Are you heading straight back the way you came? Yep. Okay. With Arabelle now in tow, uh, several of you sodden and dripping wet. Uh, you begin making your way away from the beach at Lake Zarevich and once more toward the Luna River. You pass through the faint mists and begin making your way south along the tree line of the Swalich Wood before long coming once more to the bridge that crosses the river toward the crossroads. You begin making your way eastward following the path until once more you can see the small hunkered down wrecks lingering outside of Volaki's walls. For just a moment, you can see the fog drifting aside, and you can see the old iron gates standing there in the distance, and then the fog billows forth once more, and Volaki is right behind them once again. And with that, you begin making your way southward across the winding trails that make their way through this part of the Svelich Wood. And before long, you see the hillside of the Vistani encampment coming into view once more. And that is where we will end it for today. Oh boy. We did the thing. The thing has been I done. cannot believe we saved her. I am very glad I never looked up what the actual DC was. Boy, I needed that. <laughs> happy to hear Akiva is happy. I am also happy. That was rad. For some reason, I thought it was 17, and I was about to post the Arabelle Dive meme. <laughs> oh. Yeah. There's a, oh, there's a, there's a meme? meme? Is that, is that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about it later. We'll deal with that later. We'll deal with that later. Yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> nice. We All right. did a thing. Something Yay. has been done. Beautiful. All right, well... We- we took a quest hook and we did the quest. And we're about to be rewarded from the quest. What campaign is this? <laughs> uh, you're playing Lost Minds of Fandelver. Yep. Oh, fucking sweet, man. Hell yeah. All right. This has been Storm's King's Thunder. And thank you to everyone for. Wait, no, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you to everyone for joining us today on Cursed Strahd Twice Bitten. Um, as always, we will see you all back in the mist next week. This has been a wonderful week, and we hope you have enjoyed your time with us. Until then, forget not the reach of history's lost, and take care. <laughs>